for uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield so that we can get an explanation for what, what appear to be failures on the part of the uh, two parties that employees depend upon, OPM and Blue Cross, um, uh, the failure of uh, transparency and clear explanation from uh, the Blues uh, seems to be clear. Um, it's a kind of search and ye shall find um, a very substantial cost um, change for enrollees. Um, and the failure on the part of OPM may be the honest broker failure. We depend upon uh, OPM to keep uh, the, uh, the plan, which is much um, marketed as one of the best in the country because of its choice, um, uh, transparent and um, understandable and, and frankly, to be an honest broker with uh, the plans. You know, Blue Cross Blue Shield may, may be about to squander the huge advantage uh, it has had. It's a nonprofit uh, health care plan. Uh, and one of its chief advantages is that it has seemed to offer people um, the ultimate choice, FIFA service uh, while being a preferred uh, provider. Um, but this uh, very unfortunate um, revelation uh, casts, uh, uh, w will make uh, subscribers look very closely at Blue Shield and whether or not the almost automatic renewal uh, has been worth it. Obviously, this is a more expensive plan, but uh, the very educated um, federal worker has trusted Blue Shield, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and has been willing to pay for what seemed to be, uh, to many of them, um, worth it. Uh, the cost of the standard option, however, has been increasing faster uh, for Blue Cross Blue Shield and is now considerably more expensive than for others, uh, particularly in these t hard times. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield really stands to lose market share and perhaps should. They, don't, they, sh they shouldn't be making mistakes now. Uh, and they shouldn't be making mistakes in a plan that employees have favored and, and now I think will make employees um, uh, far more s uh, skeptical. Uh, whatever the explanation, you don't bury this kind of uh, potential uh, cost increase uh, in the fine print. You don't do it when you are dealing with federal employees <laughs> because they do read. They finally get it. Uh, they perhaps got it too late, and I hope that there will be an opportunity uh, for people to consider beyond December the 8th whether or not they ought to stay in this plan, uh, particularly since most people didn't get it, I bet. And to the extent that they get it at all, it is because the chairman has come all the way from Chicago uh, to hold a hearing so that OPM and Blue Cross Blue Shield can explain themselves. As for OPM, uh, we are very disappointed. The OPM seems not to be able to, to itself keep up with the complexity that attends uh, uh, health care plans uh, today. Uh, I think everybody who is in a plan better uh, take a much closer look at these plans. And the notion that, 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 that um, uh, the, the fine print may be burying costs uh, is extremely troubling uh, because the transparency, transparency has been the hallmark uh, of the FEHBP. Um, we hope that in, in the course of, of this hearing, uh, we will understand what was at the bottom of this because we're left, you see, uh, to speculate as to why this simply wasn't made clearer 
particularly since it involves itself some complexity uh, in, in order to be understood uh, by uh, one who is enrolled. Uh, and we need to know whether or not this kind of change is emblematic of what we can expect and what OPM intends to do about it. Uh, again, I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for, for uh, believing that this was important enough to come and hold this hearing this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Delegate Norton. Um, we will now go to our witnesses. I will introduce the first panel, and then we'll swear them in and proceed. Our first panel of witnesses are Mr. Walton Francis. He is a self-employed economist, policy analyst, and expert in the analysis and evaluation of public programs. He pioneered the systemic comparison of health insurance plans from a consumer perspective, and for 30 consecutive years, Mr. Francis has authored the annual checkbooks guide to health plans for federal employees. We thank you for coming, Mr. Uh, Francis. And we will then also ask if Dr. Peter E. Petrucci will come to the uh, table. Dr. Petrucci is a board certified, is board certified in general surgery and is a fellow in the American College of Surgeons. On several occasions, the Washingtonian Magazine has named Dr. Petrucci one of the top surgical specialists in the region. He also has been awarded distinction as one of the best doctors in America, having been selected by a consensus of physician colleagues as being among the top 4% of all physicians in his specialty. Gentlemen, we want to thank you very much for coming. And if you would rise and raise your right hand, it is the uh, <coughs> procedure of this committee that all witnesses be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to the committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Gentlemen, we try and take five minutes. Uh, we don't always necessarily hold to that, but we try to have a five-minute statement. Uh, the light sort of indicates uh, the beginning. Green, go. Yellow means that you're down to one minute. And of course, red is an indication that you stop. We try not to curtail witnesses' testimony, especially if they're wrapping up. But if you would begin, and we'll begin with you, Mr. Francis, and thank you very much. Oh, sorry. As a consumer advocate and as a healthcare economist, and I'm going to make uh, some larger points uh, about some of the problems of the FEHP program that I think contributed not just to this particular benefit change that provoked uh, this hearing, uh, but as you, as you already said, Mr. Chairman, there are a number of benefit changes uh, and large premium increases in the Blue Cross uh, plan. And the question is, why is that happening and is it necessary and are there things, the forces at, uh, at issue that could have prevented some of this? Um, Focus. I, by the way, I, I am here speaking solely in my own personal capacity, not as not for Checkbook Magazine and not for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where I where I consult. Um, focusing first just on the uh, Blue Cross benefit changes this year, uh, the key point is this: the cutback in out uh, out of network surgery is. Uh, not the only uh, negative change. There are a number of others, uh, increase in prescription drug copayment, for example. Um, there are also a few benefit improvements, uh, but, the, but the benefit uh, reductions greatly outweigh those. Uh, important to understand, though, is that had Blue Cross not cut back some of these benefits, its premium increase would have been greater. Could have been several hundred dollars greater. Could have been, instead of 13 uh, percent, it might have been 20 percent. Um, the uh, Specific change that I think is most problematic this year is this uh, uh, ceiling on 
pay, or it's not even clearly described in the uh, Blue Cross brochure. Is it a deductible? Is it a copayment? Or is it just a maximum? Uh, it's never fully described or categorized, which itself creates problems I'll, I'll come to in a minute. But this increase uh, of paying up to $7,500 for, for surgery using non-preferred providers uh, presents uh, it's a massive benefit reduction, uh, though there's an offsetting uh, uh, saving for some people because it does reduce potential balance billing problems, and I think that may have been a, a, a major factor in the decision to do this. Uh, secondly, um, it's a major reduction in catastrophic protection. The um, promised uh, maximum you'll have to pay out of pocket uh, if you use non-preferred providers in Blue Cross is $7,000. But actually, it's $7,000 plus $7,500. It's $14,500 with this change. And uh, uh, that's a big, big difference. Uh, it's inconsistent, I think, with the promise and the premise that Blue Cross does remain fundamentally a fee-for-service plan and ought to have a good fee-for-service benefit. It's described in, in the cover of its brochure as a fee-for-service plan with a preferred provider network, but it ought to have good fee-for-service benefits. Finally, and, and very, most problematic, it's a gotcha trap. Um, there's always been one already been one clarification as to what happens in emergencies. Uh, because it wasn't clear earlier if you, uh, uh, someone might involuntarily be exposed to the $7,500 without even realizing that was happening. I, I do a lot of consumer advice. Last night I answered an email and it shocked me. A woman's 88-year-old mother is going to get surgery from a non-preferred uh, provider and she can't get a straight answer from Blue Cross as to whether or not this, this mother has Blue Medicare Parts A and B as to whether or not she will be exposed uh, to this payment. Uh, I looked carefully last night at the Blue Cross brochure, which has a separate promise for Medicare, people on Medicare, and it's unclear to me, but the better reading of it seems to me to be that for the first time, there's not a 100% you will pay nothing promise to the people who have Medicare Parts A and B. I'm not sure I'm reading it correctly, but the point is this shouldn't be ambiguous. There shouldn't, it shouldn't be debatable. Blue Cross representatives shouldn't be giving conflicting answers. Uh, most importantly, there are other alternatives that could have been used no matter what problem was being addressed. Uh, for example, uh, uh, pre-certification for uh, certain kinds of surgery could have been used or prior approval. Uh, uh, let me stop there. That's sort of what happened here and my take on it. Now let's talk about why it happened. There's some very important flaws. I go into these in great detail in my testimony. I won't belabor them here, but the aging of the federal workforce has created tremendous cost pressures, particularly and disproportionately on plans like Blue Cross that have loyal members who joined at age 30 when they were cheap, and they're still there at age 50 when they cost twice as much on an actuarial basis, and they're still there at age 70 when they cost twice as much again. So that's a tremendous pressure on Blue Cross. Uh, the uh, premium design of the FEHVP program is flawed in, this, in a particular way. When I pick a, a cheaper plan, I only get 75 per I only get 25 percent of the savings. The government gets 75 percent. Medicare Advantage, it's the other way around. So my incentive to find a cheaper plan is greatly reduced. I don't get most of the savings, and the incentives of the plans to, to offer less expensive benefits in, uh, is, is greatly reduced. Then we have premium conversion added to this. Premium conversion, however nice it might have been as a little added twist to fringe benefits, and it did, after all, merely put the federal workforce in the same status as the Fortune 500 workforce in terms of tax preferences on health insurance premiums, but premium conversion eroded all the incentives for cost saving on both plans and, and enrollees in this program. And it's no coincidence that the that the performance of the FEHVP has worsened dramatically in, the ten, in controlling costs in the last 10 years since premium conversion went in place. I think the Obama administration is going to deal with that issue in a broader context, but it's there. Uh, there's a serious Medicare coordination problem. Neither program has addressed it properly. I think that the current legislative prohibition, statutory prohibition against plans paying the cost of the Medicare Part B premium should be lifted and plans should be encouraged and maybe even required to pay part of that premium before they go into this, uh, you won't have to pay anything out of pocket mode, which is a huge cost driver. There's a lot of economic research that shows that, that situations where you pay nothing for medical care are situations where there's a great deal of waste or utilization, which costs the taxpayer a ton of money and other enrollees in the program a ton of money. Um, there are solutions to all these things. I discussed them. I just want to talk a moment, though, about, and then I'll end my testimony about consumer information. There is, an, an, there is a long-standing problem in the FEHVP consumer information relating to the statement and description of catastrophic protections, and it's gotten worse. 
It's gotten worse in part because plan complexity has grown. But the fact is, if you pick up a brochure today and it says this plan guarantees that you won't pay more than five or six or eight thousand dollars out of pocket, that's not true. Buried in the small print, you're going to find, oh, well, this didn't include the deductible, or this didn't include the $7,500 out of network surgery, or it didn't include your prescription drug co payments. Whatever it doesn't include, and that varies from plan to plan, it makes it impossible for an ordinary human being to compare those stated catastrophic limits, uh, and it means there's lots of loopholes in them. There's no reason this has to happen. There's no reason OPM can't require that the catastrophic limits include all the significant costs to which you might be exposed that can be measured ahead of time. That doesn't include, unfortunately, balanced billing, but, but it includes just about everything else. There's no reason why prescription drugs shouldn't be in those catastrophic limits. We don't need a separate catastrophic limit, which, to OPM's credit, they've insisted that, that all the plans give you some protection against uh, specialty drugs that can reach tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars, but that should be in the regular catastrophic limit. Then there's the question of what do consumers even learn about this stuff? Every Medicare beneficiary in the country gets mailed to them, Medicare and you, a hundred page booklet written in clear English, big typeface that explains Medicare benefits and describes in some detail the Medicare Advantage plans for which they're eligible. OPM publishes a similar booklet. This is, I'm holding up the one for uh, annuitants, Guide to Federal Benefits for Federal Retirees and Their Survivors. But this isn't mailed. Nobody gets this. They can download it on the internet, but it's not mailed to them. And of course, in the aged population, retired population, there's a very large fraction that don't use the internet anyway. Why isn't it mailed? Because OPM salary and expenses account won't, isn't big enough to pay for the postage costs. It's absurd. And there's no reason why retirees shouldn't get this information. Then, however, if you look at what's in it, OPM no longer publishes the catastrophic limit on these plans as, as in its summary description of benefits. That's probably a good thing because until they fix it, those limits are misleading. But they do, and I will say this for them, the $7,500 maximum out of, sur you know, the surgery uh, uh, cutback is shown in this, in this document, which nobody gets. The summary page of the Blue Cross brochure itself, that the last page, summary of benefits, does not show the $7,500 reduction for out-of-network surgery. So let me, let me stop there and simply say there, is, there are administrative actions that can be taken, there, is, there are legislative steps that can be taken within the jurisdiction of this committee, and there are legislative actions which may be primarily in the jurisdiction of ways and means, but they also can be taken related to Medicare coordination. That concludes my testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Francis, and we will go to Dr. Petrucci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here today. My name is Peter Petrucci, as you've heard. I'm a board-certified general surgeon and currently serve as the president of the medical staff at Sibley Hospital. I practice medicine in the District of Columbia since 1975, and I'm here today representing my patients and my colleagues. On January 1, 4 million federal employees and nearly half of the federal workforce will face drastic changes to their health insurance policy. In addition to a 13 percent increase in premiums, out-of-network benefits for federal Blue Cross Blue Shield standard option plan holders will be severely curtailed, affecting anesthesia, emergency, and surgical services, and placing a significant financial burden on patients. These changes are particularly relevant for federal employees already signed up with the federal standard option plan as their health insurance provider since they will automatically be renewed for 2009 unless they switch to another plan. With expiration of the open enrollment period on December 8th, there's little time to explore these options and immediate extension of the open enrollment should be implemented. As a senior member of our medical community, I understand the need to control our large and growing health care costs. I also understand that establishing equitable and affordable care will be a complex process and require compromise on the part of consumers, providers, and insurers. But the new policy change by Blue Cross and Blue Shield adds an alarming wrinkle to cost containment by eliminating choice and putting the financial burden squarely on the patient. This is a denial of choice by deception. The most egregious of the 2009 planned so-called benefits has to do with patient's choice of physician. Effective January 1, any patient who has surgery or any other of the so-called surgical procedures by an out-of-network or non-participating provider is 100 percent responsible for the first $7,500 of charges. This is not a one-time deductible. The $7,500 patient responsibility clock is reset with each surgery or procedure. More surprising and buried in the 135 plan, plan, page plan document 
is the policy's definition of surgery. It includes the treatment of fractures and dislocations, including casting, biopsy procedures, removal of tumors and cysts, treatment of burns, obstetrical care, including childbirth, and diagnostic colonoscopy and other endoscopic procedures. This new policy change, in effect, converts the federal standard program and point of service care plans to an HMO plan by making out of network cost prohibitive and limiting choice for the vast majority of patients. Another disturbing provision of the new policy is a $350 deductible for emergency services when they are provided by a non participating physician. Patients will be financially responsible for consultations rendered in an emergency, even if the doctor was not chosen by the patient. Acutely ill patients do not usually have the luxury of selecting their provider, yet that is precisely what will be expected and required. This $350 fee is passed on to the patient for each consulting provider who does not participate in this plan. Most importantly, and with rare exception, patients are being caught unaware of the significant benefit cuts. Regrettably, the Office of Personnel Management appears to have contributed to this confusion by having abdicated their responsibility to the 4 million federal employees and their families covered under this plan. The 2009 Blue Cross Blue Shield Standard Plan eliminates choice and transfers financial responsibility directly onto the patient, even during an emergency and without legitimate and transparent disclosure. There are already a substantial number of patients who finally informed about these changes have become angry and frustrated. Only in the last few days, after mounting pressure from angry patients and concerned physicians, were minor clarifications posted on the Federal Blue Cross Blue Shield webpage. On behalf of our patients, I would like to make the following recommendations. Restore to patient the right to choose their doctor without making it financially prohibitive. This can be achieved by Blue Cross and Blue Shield rolling back the changes for out-of-network providers to the 2008 standard option plan. Immediately extend the open enrollment period to ensure the rights of federal employees to explore and fairly exercise their right to choose a health plan that's best for them. Have OPM establish a transparent and comprehensive outreach information program that ensures clear explanation of various plan benefits and the difference between plan costs and services. Explore the process by which OPM directly responsible for representing their employees betrayed that charge by acting to negotiate and purchase as well as regulate the provision of health care benefits. These roles put OPM in a conflict of interest position. There should be a separate body including consumers and physicians which would oversee the products submitted to OPM and determine that they fairly represent the plan benefits and any changes and ensure that all federal employees are aware of proposed changes. Without such separation of purchasing and oversight powers, the opportunities for continued and future abuses remain. Instead of legitimately engaging the medical community to explore ways of lowering cost, costs, <clears throat> Blue Cross and Blue Shield has taken a hammer to this problem. In so doing, they will hurt the very patients they are supposed to serve. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, gentlemen, very much. And uh, let me also acknowledge the presence of uh, Representative Elijah Cummins, who has joined us. Thank you very much, Representative Cummins. Let me ask, um, listening to both of your testimonies, how important, and perhaps I'll begin with you, Mr. Francis, how important is it that patients or consumers have the choice of selecting uh, physicians for treatment? That's a great question, Mr. Chairman. And the answer is it's extremely important for some and not important for others, and we don't know ahead of time which people are in which category. For example, a, a very large fraction of the federal workforce, not of retirees, but of the active workers, uh, over a third enroll in HMOs where the deal is you must use HMO participating physicians or we don't cover anything. That's a choice they make. They get certain benefits for that. They get typically a better benefit package and they get uh, lower premiums. Uh, but for other people, it's vital that they be able to choose their physician uh, without any constraint. So the FEHVP needs to provide plans that offer both kinds of packages. And I think uh, the, the problem uh, here, and it's, it really is, that the the Blue Cross out-of-network benefit, and it's not significantly worse or different than those in most of the other national plans. They typically uh, pay only 75% of an allowance, and that allowance is less by far than many physicians or surgeons charge. But at least the deal is sort of clear, and, you, and you're going to have something covered, typically half or more of your cost. 
But uh, $7,500 is a mighty hefty uh, penalty to pay to go out of network. Uh, Dr. Petrucci. Yeah, <clears throat> I can't really improve on that statement. The choice really depends on the patient. Many patients choose to pick a physician, a physician that they've had a longstanding experience with. Some physicians choose to decide to go out of uh, become non-participating after patients have been with them for many years. And so that choice uh, becomes one that they, uh, that they cherish. But there is a cost savings um, when individuals limit their choices in some way. There's a cost saving the to the patient, yes. There's no yes. difference for the insurance company, however. Well, given comparisons, uh, given the changes that Blue Cross, Blue Shield are making, are there other comparable plans that uh, employees may want to consider? Well, the federal panel, and you know this better than I do, certainly has other insurance companies in the, in the program uh, that uh, allow the choice that patients, uh, the patients want so, uh, that, so that they can, they can go out of plan uh, easily and have a significant portion of their, of their expenses covered. Do they compare favorably, though? I think so. Uh, in the uh, consumer's checkbook uh, advice that we publish, uh, we find that there are a number of plans, quite a number, uh, that offer benefits as good or better than the Blue Cross standard option benefit and premiums that are considerably lower. Now, you know, no plan is better in every category and no plan is worse in every category, but there are lots of very good choices out there, uh, including, by the way, Blue Cross Basic whose distingu main distinguishing characteristic is that you can't go out of the network and get uh, any coverage. But people can make that choice and save a good deal on their premium. So yes, there are alternatives, and uh, we always recommend people consider alternatives. That's the beauty of open season, a chance to think through uh, your choices and, and consider options. I just wish the information that were out there were, were more, uh, uh, more available, especially to the retirees uh, all over the country who don't get uh, sort of the, the hothouse attention that uh, this issue gets in Washington, D.C. Well, Blue Cross has said that it will take another look or re-examine its 2009 benefit options. Um, do either of you have any idea of what that might mean? And if they were to re-examine uh, what other options or what changes might uh, they want to look at? Uh, the suggestion, uh, Mr. Chairman, I make in my testimony is that OPM and Blue Cross consider, whether or not they can do it now, I think probably they could, but I'll leave that to them to address. That <coughs> is, right away, could they change their 2009 uh, situation? But certainly, they could have put in a, a requirement for pre-approval of certain kinds of surgery, particularly where expenses, out-of-pocket expenses uh, might be very high if people were balanced billed. Uh, or whatever, they, whatever problem they're after, uh, they, could, they could require pre-approval. They did add a pre There is a pre-approval requirement for morbid obesity surgery uh, that, that I believe was just added this year, if my memory serves. So it's not as if there aren't other tools in the arsenal that could be used that aren't so draconian in their financial impact. Yeah, and, and our, our concern is that there doesn't seem to be a clear benefit. I mean, the patient understands when they come to us Patient, that is non-participating providers, that they will have a cost outside of, the, outside of their plan. The issue is this doesn't seem to save Blue Cross anything by, by just adding that deductible. Uh, they're basically saying we're, we're not going to pay anything for your, for your, in other words, if they come to me now, they have an operation, I have a charge, they, Blue Cross will pay a percentage of that charge and the patient pays the rest. That costs Blue Shield nothing. Uh, and so the question is, why the change? What difference does it make to them uh, to take away that benefit that's already there and not, not allow patient choice? And I'll just ask the last Why would a patient want to go out of network, say, to have surgery? Well, most patients are referred by their, by their primary care doctor. And they also have patient family members, friends who may have had operations by a certain physician or being taken care of by a certain physician. Uh, it has to do with a number of factors, uh, reputation, experience with a procedure. There are a lot of different reasons why a patient may choose to come to me rather than somebody else or somebody else rather than me. 
that's again patient choice, and that's and that's really all we're saying that they should be able to make that decision. And they so understand up front that they they will have an additional cost, and and we work with them on that process. And the network activity is not coordinated in such a way that, in all likelihood, a uh, primary care physician or a primary provider would not necessarily refer someone to another member of the network. I mean, to a surgeon. It, it works both. It network. can work both ways. It can work either way or both ways. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. My time is up. Uh, Delegate Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Petrucci, you say it doesn't save them anything. Why do you think they did it? Uh, that this uh, uh, large increase for consumers doesn't. I'm sorry, I didn't quite. Doesn't p doesn't save uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield anything. Why? What? 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 what do you, why do you think they did what they did? You know, I don't know. We've been, that's a question we've, we'd love to ask them ourselves. It's not something that uh, is very clear to us. You know, people can understand <clears throat> some of the increases. Um, you spoke of some of them, Mr. Mr. Francis, uh, increasing copayment and the like. That, you know, there is, I don't know if it's ever been uh, tested, but certainly there's a policy rationale that people think before they run to the doctor. Um, the failure to even understand what's happening here is what bothers me most. Now, I ought to be clear. Uh, Mr. Petrucci, I am, uh, is it Petrucci or Petrucci? Petrucci. Petrucci. Um, I, I, I believe that one of the problems with the American health care system is people can say, hey, you know, I want the same person who did your operation to do mine. Uh, so I am, uh, you know, I am, um, the HMOs have, have um, managed to, to um, uh, in many ways, uh, build up some real prejudice against themselves. Uh, but uh, one of the problems we have in this country, frankly, is that everybody wants Cadillac health care, and so we're leaving you know, 50 million people with nothing an increasing number of people, including federal employees who say, even though you're willing to pay part of it, I'm sorry, <laughs> this is even before we got to these hard times, I'm going to have to take my chances. And so part of the problem, uh, uh, so, so, so I, I, I don't, I, 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 when, when people say, when you, we see developing countries, for example, where everybody gets health care, do understand that <laughs> When that happens, it's because the society has agreed that uh, for the benefit of the many, some of us agree, unless we're going to pay for it, that we will not indeed demand um, what, frankly, in some ways, Blue Cross Blue Shield looks like it wants to provide because it's a preferred provider, uh, something of an HMO type. Uh, saving there for the consumer, and yet there's fee-for-service, and here you have America writ large in health care. Hey, you can have it all. Then what we get is this humongous uh, increase, uh, and of course, Blue, Qu Blue, 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 Blue Cross Blue Shield, that's not an increase at all, <laughs> uh, and, and they're going to have to explain themselves uh, uh, about that. Um, uh, uh, I want to ask you, Mr. Francis, uh, uh, because I'm sympathetic with uh, what you say that Blue Cross Blue Shield, because you discuss very fairly, it seems to me, the pressures on Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, as, as of course uh, is the case uh, given the nature of the healthcare system in this country, the have it all system in this country. Uh, I, I understand that, and particularly for uh, a provider that turns out to be preferred by many federal employees throughout their work life. My uh, question to you is, does this huge uh, advantage in volume or loyalty not make up in some way for the uh, disadvantage <laughs> which comes with the fact that the workforce ages uh, over time and therefore may cost you somewhat more? 
yeah, yes, it does uh, make up in a major way. For example, the plans, just being very narrowly business about it, it's to the advantage of the plans to have people who sort of don't exercise their right in open season to change plans, but stick with it, okay? That makes for predictability in expenses, uh, predictability in enrollment. Uh, uh, it's, uh, looked at from the, from the consumer point of view, if I'm in a plan for a long period of time, I get, it's sort of like wearing an old shoe. I get comfortable with it. I understand the paperwork and the bureaucracy, and I understand the benefits. And of course, that's, that is one of the problems that leads to a situation where I know the benefits of my plan. I'm not gonna reread that uh, 100 and some page brochure every year. It's awful hard reading, let me tell you. I read them all, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's distressing. So people tend to get pretty lazy about it for, with good reason, because they expect continuity and they expect no surprises. I, that's my main concern here. It's the gotcha aspect of this change. People, are, Some people aren't going to realize what's happened to them until they go get that surgery. Uh, Dr. Petrucci mentioned that uh, he works with his patients to, to warn them and, and, and so on. And, I, and I've, I often advise people when you go out of network, try to negotiate a, uh, I tell them to try to negotiate the Medicare rate. <laughs> and sometimes it works uh, uh, with people who have no health insurance at all that I counsel. But uh, some people don't do that and some doctors don't warn them. So there are surprises and it's unfortunate and I think, what we ought to worry about most uh, in oversight of these plans is that those kinds of gotcha surprises be minimized. It's not that Blue Cross and the other plans shouldn't take cost-saving steps, it's just that the cost-saving steps should not be ones that lead to uh, unfair and un un to total surprises that are financially unfair. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Petrucci, I was surprised, I'm looking in your testimony now for the uh, here it is, for the list of uh, so-called surgeries um, in your testimony. So I'd like you to explain uh, to me whether or not perhaps they're trying to keep, and perhaps they should, surgeons from doing some of these uh, procedures. For example, it says fract fractures and dislocations in your testimony. Is that, is, is that normally a matter for the surgeon? Well, I think that's one of the problems we have. The term surgery is very loosely defined in this uh, in this dialogue. The technically speaking, there's no surgery involved in the setting of a fracture. Basically, the orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon uh, sets the fracture. Can sometimes do it in their office, uh, put a cast on, and that's part of the care for that particular so, problem. So, so, so if, if, a if a surgeon is present, then then of course, uh, this. This, uh, well, this applies this to cost all, would apply. It applies to all surgeons. So an orthopedic surgeon falls into the category of surgeon, even though that particular procedure does not actually involve an operation. And that's one of the problems we have with this, is the list of, of, of things that are included really aren't technically surgery in many respects. So it's going to be up to Blue Cross, Blue Shield. So as far as you're concerned, if a, a, a surgeon does, the, does any part of the work, this $7,500 cost increase applies? Yes, any, any non-participant, patient goes to a non-participating physician surgeon and casts their fractured um, wrist, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield will pay nothing and the $7,500 deductible applies in that setting. Now, the ch obviously the charge won't be that high, but whatever it is, the patient will be responsible for. Um. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm through for the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cummins. Good morning. I, um, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this, and um, I think the thing that bothers me more than anything else is when people think they have one thing. Uh, with regard to coverage, and then find out they have something else. Um, illness is nothing to play with. We're talking about people's ability to take care of their families, to take care of themselves, to go to work, to do the things they need to do on a daily basis, and to live a quality, a certain level of quality of life. And I'm just trying to figure out um, how concerned you are as to whether people are informed. We got people, we got busy people today. They get 
if they are like me, they get 50 pieces of mail, all kinds of stuff. And you separate some of it, you try to go through the most important stuff, and you might miss something. But I'm just trying to figure out how informed do you think these federal employees are and retirees with regard to these, uh, these changes? Uh, I mean, do you have I, any clue? Yes, sir, I have a clue. <laughs> Except for the publicity that, that attends to this hearing and the publicity uh, that the Washington Post has chosen to, you know, put in its federal diary page uh, and a couple of radio shows that I've been on and, you know, some people read the federal diary, but most people don't. Some people hear my radio show, but most, certainly most people don't, don't, don't. Um, there's word of mouth. But by and large, people do not know about the benefit changes in their plans. They don't pay attention. Uh, they, they, they rely precisely, sir, because, as you said, we're all very busy. We get a ton of mail. We get a ton of documents. The thought of me as a sort of average federal employee picking up this 134-page document and sort of reading through it, it is just, no one does that. Now, what they do do in some cases, but only a minority of cases, is do what OPM advises them, and, and OPM is pretty good about most of this. Right on the cover it says, go to page 9 to see the changes in benefits. The trouble is you go to page 9 and it's a long laundry list, and buried in that long laundry list is this, to take this example, this $7,500 change, along with a lot of others. Um, and uh, people tend not to do that. So I think what's incumbent on the, on the, the, the program as a whole, I'm not blaming anybody. In fact, I think in general the program does very well at what I'm describing is to try to prevent people from f having unpleasant surprises because something doesn't work the way it used to work or something doesn't work the way an ordinary person would expect it to work. And I think by and large this program does very well at that. So I think we all need to be a little bit careful. Uh, we're taking uh, Blue Cross to the woodshed here, I guess, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's, not, it's not all bad. <laughs> All right, let me, let, me, let me ask you this. Let me just play the devil's advocate, because I think this is what OPM and maybe Blue Cross and Blue Shield say. Um, people have a choice. Uh, Cummings, why are you worried about folk when they have a choice? Um, there's probably some things that are better out there. And so um, why are you so concerned they'll go that's how you know the free market is that's what competition is all about and but and just let me give you this little footnote on the question on what they would say i think blue cross and blue shield knows that people see them as the gold standard and there are people who say to themselves if i get sick i don't want to have to worry about anything i don't want to have so I, want, I don't want to have to ask any questions. I just want to be able to go to the hospital. Don't want any problems. Just want to get treatment. So the question becomes, um, how do we make sure that folk, I mean, if they want Blue Cross and Blue Shield, that they, that they are informed, and do you think we need to extend the time uh, for them, the enrollment period, so that they can hopefully become informed. What kind of procedures would you like for uh, Blue Cross or OPM or whoever to go through to make sure people are informed of these things? Because there may be people that look at this and say, this is fine. This is great. My problem is, is that if they don't know, and then they end up in a situation where they've got their back against the wall, and there's no way that they can get around it, and they are stuck. And see, it wouldn't bother me if you're talking about stuck because you're stuck in traffic, but I'm talking about stuck with regard to your health. And so, I mean, what do you all recommend? Because I, I want the OPM and the Blue Cross and Blue Shield people to be ready for this question too. I mean, what do you all recommend? Again, there are people that probably be, may be fine with this. Well, uh, if I may answer, Dr. Petrucci already, gave, and he, he speaks for himself, but he already suggested extending open season. I'm, I'm For how long? Uh, I'm inclined to recommend against that. I don't think that's the right answer to this problem. You could extend open season another week or two weeks, and still 90 percent of the people aren't going to know, you know, and they're still going to be potentially subject to, to the gotcha. I think uh, reverse this around a little bit. First, in general, the, the choice among plans is extremely important in this program. OPM 
the key to, to running the program is that all the plans, all the choices, be good ones, okay? Then, then we don't have to worry as much about competition. So OPM serves a regulator role, a cop role, uh, and it serves it in general very well. I think this is just one of those blips. I think it's one of those things that people, it's sort of the, the forest and the trees, I don't think people quite realized what they were doing <laughs> when they did it. I may, I be, that may be unfair, and I'm sure OPM and Blue Cross can, can expand that better. My suggestion, frankly, if I were Blue Cross, what I would do, if OPM would let me, is I would simply make a benefit change, and I'd restore the, out, the, outpatient, the, the out of network surgery benefit to what it was in the year 2008. A real simple change, almost no financial consequence to the plan, if any, uh, and, and a gotcha is gone. And then uh, over the next year, uh, both parties can consider uh, how in the future they want to handle whatever problem they were trying to deal with, whether it's, whether it's balance billing or, or network uh, discipline problems or just what was going on, because there are other and al better alternative ways to deal with it. Suppose they say no. Um, you know, it's, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how to answer that. I don't think um, the, the base probably will. The basic philosophy of this program is that the plans make their benefit choices, and the government, as long as they're not sort of uh, beyond the pale, the government is going to bless them. The government is not trying to set d detailed benefit design, d make detailed benefit design decisions. So uh, I, I don't know the answer, sir. Uh, I, my guess is that um, one way or another, they're going to find a way to ameliorate this problem. I, OPM has already issued a clarification that there's not an emergency room gotcha, okay? I hope they could uh, do a little more than that. And, and, and the simplest way, in my view, is simply to restore things to the status quo ante in terms of this particular benefit. But I think I'd like to respond also because I think you speak to a larger issue, and that is our experience in the office setting is that patients really don't know what their plans cover many, many times. Even though they've signed on to this plan, they've had it for a long time. When they come to our office, it is very common for them really not to understand the nuances. And I think that's part of the problem. These plans have some very detailed nuances which are not easily spelled out, or they may be spelled out, but they're not easy to understand, even for, for us and some of our staff. I think that needs to be clarified and, and improved. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummins. Uh, Mr. Salte. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman leaning over here to this mic, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, what Congressman Cummings was saying about, you know, this is supposed to be the gold standard. In fact, it's, it's the one often pointed to in the debates about how we're going to improve the health care system. Everyone says, well, you know, we want to have the same system for everybody that federal employees have and so forth. So uh, to me, the fact that Blue Cross is resorting to or having to resort to, and we'll get their testimony on it, I guess, um, these kinds of changes may just be further evidence that the healthcare system and the coverage models that we have in place um, are continuing to break down. And um, I was curious to know, uh, if you know, what, what percentage now of patients who are uh, seeking surgical treatment are going outside of the network versus choosing the, the option of, of, of in-network surgery. Do um, I, I don't know the answer, sir. I'm sure that Blue Cross does, but I, it's a very small percentage because I think the, main, the, rent, the ordinary consumer advice I render to people is stay in the network. You join a plan, use network physicians. It's kind of a, a no-brainer if you possibly can. And cer but certainly use network physicians for anything very expensive. And I think 90, I don't know whether it's 98, 99 percent of the time, for the expensive stuff, people do that. Uh, for minor things, they may, you know, if you want to take your kid to a pediatrician who's not in the network, it's probably just 100 bucks and people will do it. But um, the overwhelming majority of the surgery in this program, I'm sure, it, of all the services of people who enrolled in the Blue Cross plan or any of the other plans, uh, it, they really all operate in the same way. They encourage you to use network physicians, and people do use network physicians. But it's so, this small percent yeah. who either, it might be ignorance, it might be a very important choice, okay? There are lots of important reasons people may choose to use a non-participating or non-network physician. And they, but that, as, as Dr. Petrucci said, people don't always 
You don't expect to have the particular medical procedure that's listed on page 87 of your brochure, you know? Maybe you got hit by a truck. So people walk into their doctor's office, they're not going to know necessarily what, what, what faces them. That's unavoidable. What isn't unavoidable is that, that, that what faces them is not something disproportionate to the, uh, to the, to the offense, so to speak. And, and that's the point here about this $7,500 uh, cap. So if, it's a, if, if, if as you are, are speculating, the percentage is very small of people that would want to go outside uh, for their surgery, then it translates, and I guess you've made this point already, that the savings aren't so great to the plan for implementing this new policy. Is that I don't correct? think there are any savings to Blue Cross that are, con con any direct savings that are consequential one way or the other. It, it may be of some benefit to them in, in uh, remember it's very important, the preferred provider system, part of the deal is you're going to accept a lower rate than that, you know, that the plan, the plan's allowance is going to be lower than we'd otherwise charge, but you're going to get more business because you're going to get the people enrolled in the plan. So all the plans have to, have to make balancing decisions to attract enough physicians into the network to get some of the business going their way. And I, again, I think Blue Cross can answer this much better than I, uh, but um, it's a small percent of people who go out of network for expensive procedures, but a small percent could be a lot of people uh, in, a, in a program, in a plan like this, which enrolls uh, almost around, somewhere around four million of those eight million lives uh, in the FEHVP. Yeah, well, and I think uh, I'd like to respond to that yeah. as well because I think that what happens is that in the new plan, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield pays nothing for that surgical procedure where currently they would be. So that even if it's yeah. a small percentage, there is a significant savings in that setting. Now, I don't know whether that was intended or not, but that's certainly the outcome of, of, of that happening. So they pay nothing at all for that first $7,500 of service. Well, we'll wait to hear from them, and I would just say that this this line, this distinction between what happens to you when you go in or out of network, uh, you know, obviously there need to be incentives to encourage people to stay in. But uh, I don't think you want to create a situation where you're basically fencing people off from the, the kind of choice uh, that they ought to be able to make. And when it's such a dramatic distinction, that can that can happen, and, and of course that's undermining this gold standard profile that the, that the plan uh, has had before now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me just ask, um, how does one know whether or not they're using a physician or a provider that's out of network? I, I mean, let's say if you are in surgery, and there might be three, four, five, six different people who will come into the surgery room and may do different things. There are two, let's talk about two different circumstances. The first is an emergency, and, and that's the one that's easiest to answer because the individual doctors who are involved in that emergency situation, whether it be an orthopedic surgeon, a general surgeon, a urologist, a thoracic surgeon, may or may not be in the plan, and the patient ahead of time usually doesn't know that. Uh, I think that I will, I think I can speak for most of my colleagues, maybe not all of them, but most of my colleagues recognize that the patient is in a bad position in that situation, and therefore the charges are kept more in line with what the standard allowances are to a certain extent. There may be charges higher than what the standard allowances are, but, but the balance billing for emergency care is much less than it would be for a patient who comes to my office to have an operation Schedule. Now, in that setting, in most physicians' offices, a patient will be told on the phone uh, when they call that we do not accept your insurance, but we'd be happy to see you. We will, we will file your insurance for you. We'll you know, do whatever you need to do for that, but we don't accept your insurance. That is the usual uh, mechanism whereby they would find out uh, that the physician is not participating. Are you a... Uh, I'm a non-participating physician. And... Was there any particular reason or reasons that you may have? There were a number of reasons, and they go back a number of years. Uh, part of it is that the current rec requirement for uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield participation uh, means that, uh, based on the care first oversight of that, is that you have to participate with all their plans, including the HMOs. And we do not want to have to do that. Our choice is not to have to do that. 
And secondly, the single most important point was that administratively, these plans are a nightmare for us because they're all different. They all have different requirements for the physician. Some require pre-certification for various tests and surgeries. Some don't. And it's impossible to keep track of that process as part of our office, regular office procedure. And as a busy group with five surgeons and a lot of patients coming for surgery, that was a nightmare for us. Let me just ask my last question. I mean, for the last uh, 40 years that I'm aware, much of the discussion around health care has been cost containment. And, and, and everything has been driven in that direction, at least conversationally, and at least in discussions. Could it be that the cost of simply continuing to escalate to the extent that um, there's just no way around um, these increases? Uh, let me, uh, I, th I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, there are ways around these increases. They are painful. They are not going to happen overnight. Uh, the Medicare trustees uh, forecast uh, dramatic insolvency for that program starting, uh, actually, in some, by some measures it's already started. The hospital trust fund is uh, not collecting as much money as, it's, as is going out. It's living off the, its balances right now. Um, there are ways, there are lots of ways to change the practice of American medicine and, and the mechanisms by which we insure and reimburse for treatment that can, over time, reduce costs. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier the tax treatment. I think every healthcare economist agrees uh, that the current uh, tax treatment of health insurance is, is uh, a terrible mistake, not just because it encourages uh, ever more increasing spending, but because it's uh, just, it's, the rich get the bigger benefit, okay? The higher your tax bracket, the more benefit you get out of the current tax treatment of health insurance. Uh, and if you're uh, someone who pays no or very little income taxes, you get almost none of the tax preference benefit. And I have no question in my mind that the Obama administration is going to look at that issue and, and propose some significant changes. But uh, the, the Medicare wraparound situation, it's not just the FDHP that has this golden wraparound where you can get 100% coverage of, hey, you want two CAT scans? Go for three. Why, why not? It doesn't cost you anything, uh, and so on. This is just a continuing problem. It's not a problem when you break an arm in, in, in an emergency. It's a problem when there's all kinds of very expensive elective treatments out there, and if they're free, in quote marks, uh, why not? Uh, clearly, there are ways to, to deal with that. Uh, one of the ways, the economist's favorite way, is charge people a little bit, but there are other ways. Uh, paying for the lo least costly alternative, for example. Um, all kinds of ways to manage care. Some of them uh, unpleasant, but some of them not so unpleasant. Managing care can actually be good for the patient. So um, I think, you know, there's a lot of struggling. Uh, quality measures, another aspect of this, uh, CMS, uh, where I consult, is a leader in developing new and better measures of quality and increasingly trying to uh, uh, make reimbursement of, of both hospitals and physicians and other providers, for that matter, uh, depend in part, at least, on the quality of their care. Quality of care includes not too much care of the wrong kind. I'll, I'll stop my, I think there are methods, but they're not easy and they're not fast. Well, I, I, would, I would like to believe there is a system, and I don't know enough about the system uh, to, to try and say that I could solve this problem today. I wish I could. Um, but I, I will just comment on one point that uh, was made in terms of managed care. We've, we've seen the managed care model, and it can be good, but it can be disastrous because what it frequently does is, is becomes an impediment for the patient to obtain care because there is a layer of bureaucracy between the patient and their care, which may be good, but it can often be bad. And so managed care by itself is clearly not an answer. Um, and I just wanted to reemphasize another point that, that I missed previously, and that is that you picked up on it, and that is the issue of surgery. Surgery is a, is, is a lot of different things as defined by the, by the Blue Cross Blue Shield handbook. Most of them aren't actually surgery. They're procedures of various types required for, for good care. Thank you. Delegate North. I had uh, uh, one, one, one further question, um, Mr. Francis, uh, uh, that I, I'd like to ask you. There's been a, um, uh, something of a um, debate raging uh, for some years now 
uh, about the fact that the Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is very much unlike other companies in as much as it is, uh, has tax advantages um, as a nonprofit, uh, has, notwithstanding the market today, uh, because I don't know the effect there, but has built, indeed required, very large surpluses of its, um, of its um, members, huge surpluses. And since it's nonprofit, you've gotten people are looking to see, well, how are you behaving like a nonprofit? Do you distribute any of that surplus? And their standard answer is one that would convince me if you could show me. Their standard answer is uh, that well, we, we give this back uh, to the subscribers. Well, if you were to ask any member of the public, even those who are concerned about the tax exempt status and, and not getting very much, frankly, uh, from Blue Cross from that status, they would say, well, if that's what you're doing with it, that's what we meant you would do with it. Do you see any evidence that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is using this huge uh, surplus it has mounted and these requires its, uh, I'm not talking about reserves, I'm talking about sheer surplus. Do you see any evidence that, that this surplus is plowed back to the benefit of consumers? Uh, I'm, I have to confess, I don't know an answer. I just that's simply beyond my my well, knowledge. Well, when you compare their, their their value and their rates with other uh, com with the commercial companies, well, uh, I think I would I would say this with respect to the uh, the issue you're raising. I think has more to do with some of the Blue Cross plans have attempted to convert from nonprofit to for profit status, and that's been very controversial. And part of that controversy has been what happens to those. Uh, surpluses they have. That was a big issue in Maryland recently, for example. No, no, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that. that no. th I'm oh. talking about if you are a nonprofit and, and you do not distribute and you, and you mount a big surplus that is not distributed to where people can see it, then a question is raised since you are exempt from certain kinds of taxes, uh, whether, whether in fact the public is benefiting from that. Now, the public could be either the subscribers, I'm not talking about the conversion issue. Yes, you would have another issue if they then had to talk about how they get distributed. I'm talking about right now, if you're sitting in competition with commercial providers who don't have a tax advantage, uh, and because of that nonprofit status, typically the government expects that uh, that surplus will be used, or at least some portion of it, no one knows how much, nobody's gonna say th that there's any percentage, but some, some, uh, portion, some, some significant proportion should be used for the public benefit. And I've described, leave aside the conversion. I'm not talking about conversion. I'm talking about these people are not seeking now, they were at one point. They're not seeking now to become something else. Uh, I I'm saying if you're sitting as a tax exempt provider or a provider with some tax advantages uh, and you look as you apparently do at all of these plans, my question to you is in your judgment, uh, do you see such cost differences or other value such that you could say that perhaps the surplus is uh, of value to the uh, subscriber because we can see it in the value or in the cost to the consumer. Um, a couple of quick comments and I'll, then I'll, but I'll defer to Blue Cross and OPM. First, it's very important. This, this program has a pretty rigorous degree of oversight in terms of the finances. And it is the case that the Blue Cross premium reflects the cost experience of the people enrolled in the plan. And, I, and you know, there may be an issue of, you know, on the very margin as to, as to sort of wh where one Sets, sets those rates exactly and how reserves and, and other funds are treated. But basically, I think people are getting value in terms of the, the they're, getting the, they're getting the services they're paying for, okay? In this plan and in the others. Well, I'm not talking they, about that. They're, they're, I, I, because if you compare com commercially, uh, but, if they have, if they have, um, uh, if they are nonprofit and they claim that that money should not be distributed the way other nonprofits do, but should in fact go back into 
their plan, you could say, uh, for example, that it does because there are more people who uh, uh, have, um, because they're older, for example. You could say that, that they're, their subscribers are older, as you, you indeed said. All I'm doing is looking for some evidence that this surplus, which has become controversial, in fact, is having the effect they say it has. Uh, sure, you're getting value, but in fact, if you have a surplus, you'd expect the surplus to, to, to get you more than value. You'd, you'd expect that since you've got money to put back, that that money would, in fact, distinguish you from others, or at least that's what they claim, that that's why they don't want to distribute it uh, elsewhere, something I would accept if somebody can just show me some evidence of it, and simply to say, well, when you compare them to commercial guys, they are, they are indeed reflecting the experience, then that, of course, doesn't show it, because that's what everybody does. I'm just trying to find where this, what I would amount to excess uh, capital that commercial, uh, commercial uh, providers don't have. I'm, I, I'm trying to find where it goes and whether the subscribers uh, of Blue Cross Blue Shield feel it in, a, in, 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 in any way. I simply can't speak to the financial aspects of that. I will say that the Blue Cross program has over the years served a number of very important, call them public good functions in this program. Uh, that go sort of beyond what a, a narrowly conceived insurance program would have to do. I'll give you two examples of that, and, and this is Blue Cross and OPM together making these calls, but, but uh, a number of the uh, union plans went out of business over the years. Plans closed down for various reasons. They just couldn't hack it. Uh, some of the people or, or options would close down. Some of the people enrolled in those plans were very old and weren't kind of with it mentally. And the question, and if they made a mistake and let their membership, uh, their enrollment in the FEHP lapse, even for one day, they, could, they would be out of the program forever. OPM went to great lengths working with Blue Cross to make sure that people were what's called auto-enrolled in Blue Cross standard as a default so they wouldn't lose their eligibility for the program. And those were expensive people. So that's an example, and it has happened several times. Well, that's times, a good example. Of, of the kind of service this, this plan uh, provides. Uh, I'll give you one other example. I'm not sure it's quite as good a one, but it uh, was the case for many years before we had mental health parity that the best mental health benefit in the program was in the Blue Cross uh, plan. And that meant they were going to disproportionately attract the heavy users of psychiatric services. And of course, you know, the, the, those costs got reflected in the premiums, but the fact is people were taken care of who otherwise wouldn't have had a home. Uh, and I think in general, Blue Cross is the plan of We've been calling it the gold standard. I don't want to call it the plan of last resort. That, that sounds, <laughs> but it's been the plan that uh, has, has provided the benefits and the coverage that, uh, that people needed. If they had nowhere else to turn, they could always just sign up for the Blue Cross plan. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, over the years, uh, been a great service to federal employees and retirees in that respect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Sarbanes, either you or Mr. Cummins have any other? <coughs> I have a question, Mr. Chairman. The, um, you know, I, I just, um, Mr. France, you held up a, a book uh, talking about the health plans. You had that book? One of you all had the book. Is that I, it? I've held, I held up, Congressman, several books. Uh, I don't well, know if this, I held I mean, up my book. This is, uh, you have something book. that describes the health plans. Yeah, there's a Medicare book that describes the health plans that are in Medicare called Medicare and You. Okay. And there's an OPM book. That's the one I want to Let's call them about. booklets. It's called The Guide to Federal Benefits for Federal Retirees and Their Survivors. This is published by OPM. It's about 100 pages plus or minus. Yeah, it's almost exactly is 100 Is that the pages. one you said it was difficult for you to understand and get through? Uh, no. Uh, the other one I held up was the Blue Cross brochure. This is the description of the Blue Cross benefits. It's 134 pages long, and it's very detailed and technical. Uh, OPM has set standards for these brochures. Uh, they try to get them written in pretty clear English. They have them uh, organized the same way, so you can turn, for example, we've been talking about the surgery benefit. You could go to a certain page in every brochure, and you'll find the surgery benefit described. So it's another section is on the, on the prescription drug benefit, and so on. Uh, it's done pretty well. Compared to the way private health insurance plans generally describe their coverages, it's a masterpiece of 
of clarity and explanation. That said, it's 134 pages of very detailed small print, <laughs> and, and nobody in the world reads every page or can understand every nuance, as, as uh, Dr. Petrucci gave several examples of that. And but I, is there anything that OPM can do to try to help simplify some of this? Uh, I mean, you, 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 on the one hand, you said it's a great book, and then you come back and you say it's not so great. I, so help me with this. I think there are things OPM could do. In other words, can they make it more <laughs> consumer friendly? I, I guess what bothers me is sometimes I think we, we, we don't have a realistic view of what people go through every day and how they live their lives. Um, and to me, if, I'm, if I am, I tell my staff when we do an event, don't do it the way you like it done. Do it the way the customer needs it done so that we can be most effective and efficient, period. Other than that, I'm wasting my time, and time is short. So I'm trying to figure out, are there things that OPM can do to help employees to better understand and navigate the system so that they can come up with whatever is necessary what they deal, deem appropriate and necessary for their family and for themselves. I mean, you have any, do you think it's fine just as it is? Yeah, Congressman, I 100% uh, agree with what you said. Uh, it's actually my main interest in this subject is helping consumers to understand and, and, and benefit from their understanding in choosing health plans and in using those health plans. I think, by and large, OPM has done a very good job on this. I'd give them a B plus. Uh, they have a very good and well-organized and clear and useful website. I think the brochures, as I mentioned, uh, they're long and complicated, and I wish they were less long and less complicated, but under the circumstances, they do a pretty good job on those. Uh, they do have these summaries <coughs> of benefits, such as the one I held up. That isn't as good as it should be for an, uh, the reason that, it number one, it could present a little more information, like what's the catastrophic benefit, and number two, because they, they don't, standardize the way benefits are described. I want to emphasize, I don't mean you have to standardize the benefit itself, but because, for example, the catastrophic estimate for each, the catastrophic promise of each plan isn't, in fact, there's an apples and oranges comparison because they aren't actually defined the same way, and they could be, I think there's work to be done. And okay. I think uh, this uh, example, to this uh, problem we were talking about today is a, a wonderful example of if OPM had a rule in place that says any significant uh, deductible co-payment or other, or other maximum, including this $7,500, whatever it, it's technically called, it's not very clear, must be included in your catastrophic promise. That is, you can't put it in a footnote that there's this extra $7,500. It has to be part of that number that everybody sees. So that number would have been in 14000 and something instead of 7000 well, I, I, I think they wouldn't have done it. I've got to cut you off because I want to ask the doctor, Dr. Petrucci a question. But I'm sure OPM is listening to you, and we want a, a more we want a friendly, uh, user-friendly document uh, for our employees. Don't no. we see it from we see it from the patient side as well? As I said earlier, patients will come to the office, think one thing about their plan, and be something completely different. But but doctor, yeah, you, let me tell you what is concerning me about what you said. You were talking about uh, the definition of surgery yes. and how I guess it's. Um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield may, or OPM, uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, I think it was, define surgery one way, and you, and and you see surgery another. And well, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. Let me yeah, ask the question. Good. You, you're a surgeon, is that right? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, and is there anything that OPM can do to straighten that out? Because where you were just about to go, I think, uh, before I rudely cut you off. Um, is, you know, we need, I mean, if there are things that we can clarify, and, I, and I'm sure, I, I'm not a doctor, so, and I know certain things get kind of murky and grayish maybe, but it seems to me surgeons ought to be able to figure out what surgery is. And, and I don't know, you know, who's making the decisions uh, at Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I guess they're doctors. But but my point is that sometimes it seems to me that there should be some kind of clear understanding, if that's possible and practical, of what surgery is. I agree. Because it seems to me, when I look at the information, if you've got a dispute about what surgery is or is not, 
that's a problem. I agree completely. I think, I think the, the list of procedures, the list of conditions that are included under the surgery, surgery mantra, if you will, includes a lot of things, including procedures which are typically not considered surgery, but for example, childbirth, obstetrical care and childbirth is included in that list. There's really not usually surgery there unless the patient has cesarean section, obviously. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a definitional process which is, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's certainly not medically the way we would think of surgery. And what would you recommend with regard to clearing that up? I mean, I mean, if, if you had a magic wand and if government worked the way government, you'd like for government to work, what would you like to see government do? Well, I think obviously the first thing here with that issue, um, I think Blue Cross has to be upfront about what they're saying. And that issue, they're, what they're basically saying is that there are a whole group of procedures here that we do not want patients to go out of the plan for, for whatever reason. And that includes all these various treatment types. They list them as surgery. They're not really surgery. So they need to be more upfront about what this issue is. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for your testimony, and we really appreciate it. And we will go to our next panel. Thank you. Our second panel will consist of, uh, we've heard a lot about OPM. <laughs> Ms. Nancy Kichak. She is the Associate Director for the Human Resources Policy Division for the Office of Personnel Management. In this position, she leads the design, development, and implementation of innovative, flexible, merit-based human resource policies. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kichak, for being with us. Um, Mr. Stephen W. Gamarino is Senior Vice President of National Programs for the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, the Blues as they're called. Mr. Gamarino oversees the Blues Federal Employee Program, which administers the largest privately underwritten health insurance contract in the world, with premium income exceeding $18 billion. The Blues have approximately 50% of the federal market. Thank you all both for coming. And if you would stand and be sworn in, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to the committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. The record will show that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Uh, Ms. Kichak, it's good to see you again. Thank and you. Thank you very much for being here. We'll begin with you. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me here today to discuss the benefit and premium changes for the Blue Cross Blue Shield benefit plan. The FEHB program annually provides $34.9 billion in health care benefits to over 8 million federal employees, retirees, and their dependents. In January of 2009, enrollees nationwide will have 269 health plan choices from which they may select their coverage. At the end of this year's negotiations, Blue Cross and Blue Shield and OPM signed a contract that realigned benefits at no increase in cost to the program for non-emergency surgical procedures performed by non-participating physicians. The agreement was that enrollees would pay the full cost of the procedures up to $7,500 and then Blue Cross would pay the additional charges. This provision was included in the plan because OPM's review of disputed claims over the last several years revealed a hardship to federal employees and retirees. Time and again, disputed claims were submitted to OPM by patients with skyrocketing out-of-pocket costs due to the current policy for elective surgeries which requires enrollees to pay 25% of the plan allowance plus any difference between the allowance and the billed amount. Because there was no limit on the amount that could be collected from federal employees, 
and because non-PAR doctors charge substantially in excess of allowable amounts for their out-of-network surgeon services, in some cases, the enrollees cost total tens of thousands of dollars. For example, we reviewed a case in which one federal employee who had back surgery ended up being responsible for paying the doctor over 55000 of his own money. Now, this would be a gotcha, where you go to a non-PAR doctor and you have to pay the, the difference between the allowable and the billed amount. Once the 2009 policy becomes effective, the maximum out-of-pocket will be defined for enrollees who obtain surgeries from non-participating doctors while reducing costs for federal employees and annuitants using the most expensive services. The set copayment of $7,500 enables members to know, should they choose a non-participating provider, that they will be responsible for paying only up to that amount. Blue Cross Blue Shield pays any amount in excess of the fixed copayment. Alternatively, federal employees can choose to stay in network, and by far most do, at which point this policy does not apply, or they can enroll in a plan other than Blue Cross and Blue Shield. The $7,500 copayment does not apply to surgeries resulting from accidental or emergency situations, and it is not subject to the annual deductible. Blue Cross's testimony suggests that these benefits should now be reconsidered. OPM stands behind the contract as agreed to. Continuous negotiations and benefit changes would create confusion in the program and make it virtually impossible to provide sufficient information for enrollees to make an informed open season decision. We remain committed to protecting the interests of the federal employees who dis whose disputed claims presented evidence of an overwhelming financial burden. Also, from a competitive standpoint, it would be unfair to reopen negotiations with a single plan without making that same opportunity available to competitors. Each year, OPM works with insurance companies to, go, to negotiate a package of benefits that provides comprehensive coverage at the lowest possible cost. We work diligently to strike a balance of protection against catastrophic events without shifting a high premium burden to enrollees and firmly believe the negotiated co-pays for out-of-network surgeries achieve that balance by limiting costs for users of expensive surgeries without transferring more costs to enrollees who stay within network. Mr. Chairman, we are six days away from the end of the time period for which federal employees can choose their health care plan for next year. If changes are made at this late date, all of the information posted on our website, sent to the agency's human resource benefit officers, and to the employees and retirees themselves who need this information in order to make an informed decision about their health care options would need to be revised. We encourage enrollees to take the opportunity during open season to review their health insurance coverage needs and any change in their plan's premiums and benefits and then decide if they should consider a change in plans or options. I appreciate this opportunity to testify before the subcommittee on this very important issue and will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Kirchak. And we will go to Mr. Gamarino. Good morning, uh, Chairman Davis and members of the subcommittee. I'm Steve Gamarino, and I'm proud to represent the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans who make up the independent plans who both underwrite and administer Blue Cross Blue Shield government-wide service benefit plan. I'm also proud to <clears throat> indicate that we serve more than 4.9 million active and retired federal employees and their dependents under this plan. Through our participation in the FEHBP, we've made available to active and retired federal employees and their families the deep provider discounts and broad networks that our local plans have developed on the basis of their extensive commercial business. An estimated 95 percent of eligible providers participate in our nationwide Blue Cross Blue Shield network. That's over 400,000 physicians today. 
Mr. Chairman, today's hearing provides a welcome opportunity to address changes that we've negotiated for 2009 and to specifically address the benefit for surgery provided to standard option members by non-participating surgeons and to explain the problem that it intended to address. Much concern has been generated about this change, even though it affects a relatively small population. It has become evident to me, however, that some of this concern is justified, and we do need to re-examine the benefit design for 2009. The Service Benefit Plan offers federal employees and retirees two options from which to choose, standard and basic option, which have become the two most popular choices in the FEHBP today. I will continue my remarks today and focus on the standard option plan because the issue before us does not relate to basic option. Standard option covers professional services provided by three categories of professional providers, preferred, participating, and non-participating. Preferred and participating providers have agreed to accept an amount that we have negotiated with them as payment in full for their services. As a result, members cannot be billed for the difference between a negotiated amount or the allowance, as we call them, and the provider's charge, a practice, a practice known as balanced billing. Members can generally save the most money by using preferred providers, and we make them aware of this fact. When using either preferred or participating providers, service benefit plan members are responsible only for their, their deductible co-insurance and co-pays. Today, our experience shows that 96% of all medical services are provided by in-network doctors and 98% of all surgeries are. Non-participating providers, on the other hand, have no contractual relationship with us. So they are, there, they are not obligated to accept our allowances for their services as payment in full. Instead, they are free to balance bill the member, and many do. Ironically, it was to protect our members from having to pay exorbitant balances that we work with OPM to negotiate a different benefit for surgery performed by non-participating providers. We reasoned that if we capped the members' out-of-pocket costs, we could relieve some of the burden placed on members who choose non-participating providers for what is typically the most expensive type of professional service that they're going to receive. Members will pay 100% of the amount billed by non-participating surgeons up to $7,500 per surgeon per day on which the surgery is performed. After that, we'll cover the rest. The benefit, as you've already heard, does not apply to emergency surgery or surgery for accidental injuries. In re-examining the benefit initially negotiated for 2009, and in view of the expressed concerns that we've already heard, we will be pursuing an alternative that would allow us to administer the benefit in a way that is consistent with other services that are covered out of network. We would do this in a way to ensure that the alternatives do not result in an increase in our premiums. Mr. Chairman, we take very seriously our obligation to offer federal employees and retirees high quality, affordable health insurance through the FEHBP. Blue Cross Blue Shield members have access to the deepest discounts and most extensive networks, and we strongly encourage standard option members to use preferred or participating providers to lower their cost. In order to keep our products competitive in the program, we are going to continue to make difficult decisions and develop benefit designs that meet the members' needs and keep our premiums competitive. We appreciate your interest in the program and look forward to working with you in the subcommittee to address this and other issues that are so important to federal employees and retirees who rely on the FEHVP for their health care coverage. This concludes, Mr. Chairman, my prepared statement, and I look forward to answering any questions that you and the subcommittee may have. Thank you both for your testimony, and um, I'll begin with the questioning. One of the major concerns that uh, has been expressed by enrollees, and of course we also heard that concern expressed by Dr. Petrucci, and Mr. Francis testified that the 2009 changes create this gotcha trap for people who just simply don't know, did not know, um, were not aware and are not aware. In addition to that, 
the brochure, that is the Blue, Blue Cross brochure summary description, nor the OPM website adequately discloses mm -hmm. seemingly the 2009 benefit changes. Uh, the question actually to both of you, as you look back at this or in hindsight, do you think that enrollees were adequately notified? And if they were not adequately notified, is there any way to correct this? Or does this give us some information for future negotiations and especially for ways of trying to make sure that the consumers are aware of what they're getting? Uh, perhaps I'll begin with you, Mr. Kuchak. Okay. First of all, the, the major change was described on the change page of the Federal Employees Benefit Brochure. The Federal Employees Benefit Brochure was standardized in a plain language initiative in which the change pages were moved to the front of the brochure so that they, they would be easily found by every Federal employee. They have, even when they were not in the front, even when they were the back page of the brochure, they have been known by federal employees to be the source for looking at how, every, how the plans are changed, and everybody gets a copy of the brochure for the plan they're in. That's provided to them. The $7,500 was also in the comparison chart uh, posted on OPM's website uh, now. We, work, we have changed our website this year to make it user, more user-friendly. We are continuously working on improving the information, and we will continue to do so. But that information was there, and it was available. I would also say that, again, this problem, this benefit was designed because of the folks who were subject to balanced billing. I would expect that those folks who use have been subject to balanced billing would know to check for that in the brochure. The brochure is well indexed. I understand it's, it's a very long brochure, but you can very easily find which section of that brochure deals with benefits that you're accustomed to using. So if you've had been using non-participating uh, physicians before, you can find that in the brochure by using the index. So the material is good. Yes, it can be better. We are working on it. We're working on it on our website, and we can also work uh, and will work to make those brochures more clear. But it is a very, very complex uh, program. It's complex benefits, we agree. And we, we have not, we're not just starting that. We've been working on that for a very long time. And I think Mr. Francis, Francis mentioned that we've standardized the layout of brochures to help people do more comparisons. Let me just ask quickly, though. Um, new enrollees, individuals who are just coming in, will they get the benefit of, of the proposed changes that are being worked on? Well, if they're new, the plan is new to them. So the, the change page won't matter. They can look at the comparison chart to see how the different, a new employee gets to choose uh, their coverage when they enter. And they can get the comparison chart, they can look at the website, there are uh, plan selection tools on the website that you can use to put your benefits in and, and get some recommendations. Uh, if you are new, you might miss the op open season fairs we have at the agencies, but the agencies send, the plans send representatives to the agencies to discuss benefits also. Uh, yes, um, I think OPM does an excellent job in terms of educating the changes as uh, Ms. Kicek discussed. Um, I think as the other panel have, has already indicated, um, the, although we educate and educate, that doesn't mean that everybody understands those changes. Um, because of this particular issue, we are mailing out to every one of our members clarification regarding this particular issue right now. So we recognize that everybody didn't quite understand what the changes were, and we're trying to improve the education by um, ha having an increased 
um, information go out at this time. Now, I think I heard Mr. Kuchak suggest that if there were changes that it would be very difficult to implement. And of course, if there are changes with one contract, mm -hmm. then that necessitates um, taking a look at uh, opportunities mm -hmm. for other contracts. And um, I'm, but I'm hearing you say that Blue Cross Blue Shield is open and is in mm -hmm. fact looking at and working towards a different option relative to the surgery benefits and the way that's handled. Yeah, there, there's two tracks that um, we would like to pursue with the agency. Um, one is if uh, no benefit changes can be made for 09, that we take a look at how we're gonna administer this. I think the, uh, the previous panel indicated some issues associated with this and I'd like to um, follow up with them and understand those issues better so we can make sure if we do implement this the way it's defined right now, that we do it in a way that's sensitive to our members. Um, additionally, I do think that what, we, what we, we traded off, we improved one part of the benefit in terms of these um, uh, excessive billings by some of these non-participating providers, and we have a great protection now that we didn't have before. So f from that vantage point, I think the, the OPM has done a very good job in terms of protecting uh, their employees and their retirees. As I look at it, um, I think you could say we could have done a better job associated with the other side of the coin um, in terms of, of people that had costs that, were, that weren't excessive, but um, there is an expectation. We talked about the gold standard and um, I take that to heart. Um, when you take a look at the program and you take a look at complexity, um, one thing that I'll be looking at in terms of options, um, and there are primarily two. One is from the member perspective, um, could they readily understand this and is it consistent with the overall intent of the product? And I think that's some of what you're, some of what you're hearing is everything else works one way this works in other. And, and um, no matter how much you educate, I if you have those types of aberrancies, it's, it's very difficult for the member um, to feel comfortable with the uh, coverage that they have. So that's something I, I do intend to address, either through administration or um, some type of recommendation associated with 2010 benefits. Um, the other thing is cost. Um, the, 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 the trade-off we made here um, it results in less money going in, in one pocket and more in the other. And um, it's important as we look through this that we do it in a way that doesn't raise premiums. Affordability is an issue we've already addressed, um, and it's my intent to ensure that as we look for ways to improve um, how, we, how we administer uh, this particular area, that we do it in a way that's sensitive to the uh, cost of care. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Norton. No, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. What changes are you considering, Mr. Gamarino? <clears throat> oh, what, I'd, what I'd like not to do here at the hearing is, um, is uh, discuss the specifics behind that. Um, See, that's and, what, you know, th there's a problem. The transparency has been a problem here. Well, to the extent that we can't learn anything from you, sure. even about what you're considering, okay. that problem remains, sir. Well, l let, me, let, me, let me try to help out there without, without um, uh, negotiating here, um, because I what, that's what I don't want to do. Um, uh, if you just take a look at our benefit design, if you just take a look at the consistency of the cost sharing with in-network and, and out-of-network benefits, um, basically what you'll find, you'll see that the number in terms of the cost sharing is consistent regardless of the service rendered. And it's that type of what, what, what happened in this case is um, that consistency was broken. The, the, the cost sharing that's consistent with other medical services were, was broken. 
And it's that, it's that type of thing that I want to look at um, and try to restore that type of consistency regardless of the service. At the same time, I think it's important to protect the member against egregious um, charges in billing uh, for out of network services. Uh, one thing you might consider is the, the use of the word surgery. Uh, uh, we were stunned to see the cross the board use of that word. Some clarification there to limit. Yeah. That's exactly the type of thing I want to focus on um, relative to how we administer this. You know, you uh, cut somebody <laughs> at surgery, you know, you put a cast on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you still have the same $7,500 mm -hmm. per quote surgery. That's going to give Blue Cross a really bad name, particularly since the language that was used, and here I'd like to hear you justified since you, Mr. Keith Jackson, you like it just the way it is. <laughs> okay, since you're, you're supposed to be the, the uh, watchdog here, do you approve? Um, do you approve of the, the fact that um, the language used to, quote, to reveal uh, this change was as follows? Um, some costs do not count toward this protection. Do you consider a $7,500 uh, additional cost per surgery uh, not worthy of some greater mention than that uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield? First of all, most of the folks using the out of patient surgery, the out of the non-participating provider surgeries will not pay $7,500. That's not my question. So if you have to pay it once and you didn't have to pay it before, Ms. Kichak, please don't minimize what this means to the consumer. That's not your role. <laughs> You're not Blue Cross Blue Shield. You're supposed to be the, the person that monitors this for us all. So whether it's one, whether you've got to pay 7500 or 15000 you know, it's what, it's a cost you didn't have last year and did not expect this year. So I wish you would respond to my question. Do you think the language used uh, was, was sufficient to inform consumers of an increase of this kind. Can I ask which language you're reading? Are you I reading from the change page or are you reading from the brochure? I'm reading from the language that, w the only language that was used that gave people, reading from the summary, a the summary. An, an indication of this cost increase. I think we should work on the language. I just appreciate that. If we, mm -hmm. uh, if we can learn from this experience, we'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But if the point is simply to justify what's happened, uh, then of course we're not going to please consumers and we're going to think we're not getting I anywhere. Indeed, I was surprised because it's not in your oral testimony. Here you have Mr. Gamarino. Mm -hmm. This is the difference maybe between bureaucrats and somebody who has to be in business. And we're going to have to have government ha respond the way somebody in business has to. Well, Mr. Gamarino says he's considering changes. You say you like it the way it is. At least you say it in the oral testimony. I had staff look. I said, I don't see that in her written testimony. No. If that's your view, I'd like you to explain uh, why you think it should remain uh, as it is. As, as best I could pick up, they were bureaucratic reasons. Uh, there might be good and sufficient reasons. I don't think protecting enrollees from sixty and $70,000 worth of cost is bureaucratic. I mean, we have numerous disputed- Sixty or $70,000 worth of cost in what way? That is what our enrollees, our federal employees and retirees were paying under the benefit as it is today because they were totally at risk between what is allowable and what the balance bill was. So you, was. Think, you, you think that the underlying change is a good change and you'd prefer to, we, to let it We constructed it to protect the extremes. And in, the, in that process, the people with the lower level, lower cost surgeries are paying more. And we- Do you believe surgeries uh, should have been, a distinction should be made uh, among surgeries? I believe putting that on a cast 
and doing a major surgery where you have to cut somebody, to be blunt about it. We are using, surgery has been uh, categorized the same way in all the plans, uh, using CAS, As using you see, factors. that's what I mean by a bureaucratic explanation. Because we've always done it that way, that's the way, that's the reason we did it, even though there was a substantial increase in cost to the consumer. That is my, the source of my well, impatience. But there is not, in aggregate, there is not a substantial increase in cost to the consumers. On average, it works out. Some people pay more, some people pay less. And we were trying to you deal. No, but the person who has to pay more does not have all the people who have to pay less before them or care. So I, 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 am, not, I, I, don't I am not taking issue uh, at the moment with the underlying decision. I okay. am taking issue with your notion that nothing should be done. Uh, even though the language did not warn consumers that there was a change that could have an effect, and if I may say so, a negative effect on them. Well, and you have, I think, already conceded that the language needs to be used. Not uh, only looked at. if I did not mean to give the impression nothing should be done, I was addressing the benefit which was constructed, we thought, to provide a level of protection to our, our members. We are issuing additional information. We have sent things to the benefit officers, we have clarified the brochure. We have made web, web changes. We are trying to and improve the information. And I appreciate that, Ms. Chief Jack, and nor do I have generally a problem with your materials. Uh -huh. uh, but then we haven't seen this kind of change for, for employees, the majority of whom are in this plan. Indeed, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Gamarino, um, uh, and you, uh, Ms. Kichak, in, in considering this, did you consider other ways? Uh, because I am not, as you could see from the way I quit catching the last the question, the last witnesses, I am not. Uh, uh, I, I am not in favor of the American approach to health care, which is that we shouldn't worry about costs. We, the individual, um, and therefore, I'm very much for your network notion. You're you're making people um, uh, stay in the network uh, to the extent that it is fair and possible, pay more for going out of the network. Did you consider other ways, uh, particularly given the figures that you've named, some 96 percent, apparently virtually everybody stays in the network, uh, did you consider other ways other than this uh, cost, I don't know, second opinions or some kind of permission before you used uh, a, someone outside the network rather than to throw this very large uh, payment on those accustomed to doing so, understand, and now are told they can't. What, what, aren't there other ways to, to perhaps get the, um, get the result you want, uh, then through a large uh, increase per surgery, reset every time per surgery, mm. uh, it goes up. You know, and th those are the types of things I want to explore. I mean, did we consider them uh, through negotiation? I don't have any specific examples, but. Uh, um, I can just tell you, um, normally what happens during the process is um, there are a number of things considered. Um, in this case, the balance came down on the side of these egregious. Well, were second opinions considered? Um, not to my knowledge. Yeah. Would, you, <coughs> would, would, would you agree to consider uh, second opinions, if not now, in, in the future? I, I, I would like to consider um, any and all options because I'm, this, in my opinion, is not where <coughs> I want to be in the long run on this, on this coverage. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may have further questions, but I'll pass on to others now. Thank you very much, Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Cummins. Mr. Gamarino, um, you know, I've been around here a few years, and uh, hmm. you know, we, we get a lot of promises. And I, and I have no, no uh, some of those promises are kept, some of them are not. What happens is that uh, what I've noticed is that people will make promises and then they wait. And uh, either for a new Congress and or circumstances change or whatever, and the promises sometimes disappear. But people still have problems, the people we represent. 
So I, I just want to nail you down a little mm -hmm. bit here. What are we talking about timetable-wise? I mean, I, and, I, and, and by the way, your reputation is impeccable. And I said so it's not, but I, I, I'm telling you, uh, the people that I represent, they like to have answers because uh, they've got to make decisions. Mm -hmm. In six days, I think it is, a few days, the decisions are going to have to be made. Uh, you talked about reconsidering, reexamining. Uh, certain things, and I'm just trying to figure out what is your timetable? Does that, I mean, what, how do you see that yeah. happening? Yeah. Um, let me uh, give you, I guess, what I would consider the outside time, okay? And that is um, if, um, remember that I, I can't act unilaterally. I understand. Um, and so, uh, in this regard, um, at a minimum, I'm going to be seeking changes for the next um, calendar year when we go through benefit negotiations. That, that's a minimum uh, depending upon what I can achieve between today um, and, um, uh, and in a, you know, a very short time period. I do want to do something. This is not consistent with how we want to deliver products to our members. Um, and I can just, um, you know, I've been before you many times before, and um, uh, it's, this is something I want to change. Um, in the short run, at a minimum, if, if the benefit cannot be modified um, then for 09, then I want to look at all I can do on the administrative front to ease the burden on members that are affected by this change. Now let me let me let me let let's come to uh, my constituents. Let's say these folks back here are my constituents here, and um, there's somebody here can turn it can you know uh, who's considering a non-network surgical service. They want to have that done within the next six right. months. Right. How does? I mean, and they're looking at Blue Cross Blue Shield. They love you. They right. think you've done a great job. But now they're facing a decision. Yeah. And, they, and they, this, this sounds nice, right. but they've got to make a decision. Uh, so what, what do you say to them? I, what they have to do is go by the brochure as it stands today. I, I would not expect them um, uh, with... with um, uh, with what I've put on the table so far, that they may get the type of change that um, uh, they would expect. So I think you have to go by, by the negotiated brochure as it stands today. And, um, and at a minimum, you know, you would expect something in 2010. Um, and then uh, if we can pursue other options that are um, agreeable with the agency, I want to implement them. The um, Ms. Kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, what about? Uh, you, do you feel like your uh, constituents? Uh, I mean, our employees know about these uh, changes. We think that we're getting the information out. Yes, and we think it, it's uh, again because these claims with non-participating providers have been so damaging to people who use non-PAR doctors, not just in this instance, but you're, this is the first time uh, anybody's tried to deal with the balanced billing uh, problem. These folks are paying the full balanced bill. And um, so we think they're, they're, certainly if they've been subject to it, they're looking at this kind of thing. Uh, we are sending out more information as Mr. Gamarino said, they're sending out more. We've changed our websites. Uh, the information is getting out. Did you consider giving a, having an extension of the enrollment period? In order, um, it's very, number one, it's, it's very difficult to stand, extend the enrollment period. And the other thing is that that creates extreme challenges for the operation of the program because we're already at this, uh, this, we're getting to mid-December, we're the first week in December, 
Anybody who changes has to get their enrollment card, possibly get new doctors, learn new benefits. We have to get that information from the uh, places where the changes occurred, whether it was in the HR office or on the website, out to the plans. And there's always a, a struggle at the beginning of the year around January if uh, an enrollee needs new services and they don't have that enrollment card yet. And if you extend the open season, that jeopardizes that even further. So we don't think that's a good idea. Now, there's an opportunity for people who learn this over the next week to go to their HR office and say, I need to make a belated enrollment for this reason. But we do not want, we do not want to extend the open season. Mr. Chairman, I just have one last question. Mr. Gamarino, I appreciate you know, your testimony and talked about the surgery benefit charge um, uh, with regard to the 2009 uh, option plan, but, but let, me, let me just ask you about this. Um, you know, that change was not the only thing that we were concerned about. Uh, catastrophic out-of-pocket limits for 2009, for example, were increased by $500. Mm -hmm. Further monthly premiums will increase 13 percent to $152.06 mm -hmm. for individuals and $356.59 for families. And um, th these are real dollars. I mean, you know, thank God gas has come down, but people see their paychecks mm -hmm. shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Mm -hmm. And can you help me and explain to me, you know, why that is? I mean, it's, you got 13% increases, quite substantial. Um, and it, I think it's a little bit above what it's been in the past. I think it was like mm -hmm. around eight percent in the past. Well, it's actually been lower than that. Yeah, yeah. So, so what help you know help us to sure. understand that because you can imagine <clears> when people uh, see that coming out of their paycheck and they're used <clears> to <throat> people that I represent um, a change of that of that that little that amount of money can throw their budgets completely off, or some of these young people are just you know, uh, getting start, family started or whatever. So just can you help us with that? Right. Um, I, I would like to um, just go back and, and um, level set. Um, the increase we had this year um, was greater than um, our comp competition, and it was greater than what we um, had put through the last few years. As a matter so your, of your increase was greater than your competition? Sure. Okay, I just yeah. want to make sure I understood. Um, and uh, so I, I appreciate your question. You know, why? Why, why did that happen? Um, it, there's a couple of things um, uh, going on. Uh, one thing that you'll see in the FEHBP, um, you'll see dynamics where, where carriers are going up and down and changing benefits. We don't do it in lockstep. Uh, as, uh, um, actually, if you just take a look at, at, at what we've, what our premiums have been on standard option, that's, at, uh, that's our flagship product. You know, over the, over the last five years, our average has been 5.8 percent, the last four, four. So we, we uh, last uh, four years, 5 percent, um, and the last just couple years, 3.5. So we were holding our, our rates down actually lower than our competitors um, uh, on average in previous years. Um, so in one sense, we're catching up. The other thing that was happening is um, our, our um, coverage really hadn't changed much over the last uh, five to six years. Um, our co-pays on drugs, for example, really, if you just take a look back in previous years, they really haven't changed since 2002. Um, and what, what was happening is a lot of our competitors have been making changes. They have been making benefit modifications. Um, they have been introducing new lower cost products. Um, uh, and uh, additionally to that is the demographics of the standard option Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and this is something that, um, you know, the country is seeing, the FEHPP sees even greater, and then the standard option Blue Cross Blue Shield sees it even more, and that's the aging of the American population. The average age in our standard option product now is 61. That's not your typical plan. And the fact that we've been, been able to hold down our premiums and keep our coverage relatively stable for the last five years, I think has been a great accomplishment. But um, that, that safety valve, we, we had to let go of. 
Uh, the fact of the matter is that the last couple years our expenses are running at a rate that's slightly greater than the premium income. And um, you know, Ms. Norton, to your question about reserves, that's one thing that we do at Blue Cross Blue Shield. It allows us to stabilize things from year to year normally, but we can draw down sometimes our reserves um, and sort of um, cushion some of the things that go, go on from year to year. So it's a combination of the demographics of the population. It's a combination of the dynamics of the FEHBP where, where price is king in terms of, in terms of people looking at, um, at, at uh, benefit plans. People are very price sensitive. And, um, and in many cases, what you're going to see over probably the next couple of years is more and more cost-effective plans and probably enrollees making that choice through open season to go to lower cost plans. Um, the federal employee and retiree are very astute shoppers. You know, we, we talked about the educational issue. That's true, but I will put the, these shoppers in health care up against anybody in the country in terms of overall understanding their benefits and getting value for their dollar. Just run real quick thing. You, following that logic, uh, then it seems to me then that you probably so you, you, I'd almost have to predict that premiums will continue to, to skyrocket for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And let me tell you why, based upon what you just said. Um, younger people are going to probably go for the plans that are cheaper, figuring they're not going to get sick, they're not going to need whatever. Older people will go more, I guess, towards Blue Cross and Blue Shield because they feel like they can get the things that they need. So that 61 may go up even higher, that average age of 61 may go up higher. Is that a, is that a reasonable um, uh, That's that's uh, That's a hypothesis that uh, might play out. Um, what, what I think you're going to find is, number one, everybody in the FEHVP, if, you're, if you want to play in this market, you're going to have to be able to service and manage an aging population. Nobody's going to get out from underneath that. Um, uh, uh, if, if you just take a look at the demographics, uh, number one, it's one of the few employer groups now that also the retirees get exactly the same coverage at the same price. So from that, you know, that's a little bit out of the, so, so when we take a look at, you know, other employers, a lot of them just cover their actives. In this case, the, the, the band is a lot bigger. And so it's just something I think w we are in it for the long run. So we're going to find solutions and value propositions that even if they, they may be paying more for our plan, but they're going to get a value proposition uh, in terms of what they need to navigate for their medical care that we believe that they're going to be willing to pay for. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummins. Uh, Mr. Sarbane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a, this is a great uh, panel presentation just because it shed a lot more light on the issue. What's, what's intriguing to me is normally when you have uh, proposals for these changes in the benefits and the costs that go with them, uh, it's driven by the plan's concern about, you know, protecting the economic model and solvency and so forth. And many of the changes proposed fall into that category, but it seems like the one having to do with this, with the out of network surgery was based on a much different premise. And so my first question is, it sounds like OPM went to Blue Cross to initiate this change, not the other way around. Is that true? That's correct. Okay. Why is the, you said that there's an exception uh, with respect to this change for emergency uh, surgery and another category, what was the other category? Accidental injuries. Yeah. Okay. An, an accidental, accidental injury. injury. So how come? Why is there an exception for those two? I think the thinking is that the, the member had very little choice in terms of where they had to go for the, for the care. And therefore, the, the, um, uh, we weren't going to, we were going to safeguard their interest because they're in an ambulance, they're going to the nearest facility, 
um, being treated by the uh, um, uh, best available physician at that time. And so they, so they, they might have to go out and network. Oh, well, they might. Point. Yes, it happens. That, that's the reason, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if they go out and network, then they're still going to get hit with that balanced billing issue that you're trying to protect all the other people from. So I don't understand if, if that's the underlying rationale why you're not trying to protect those people too, Miss. Right. I think, I think, um, first of all, this is the first time that balanced billing has been addressed in any way, F frankly, I think in any of our plans. And we've been trying mm -hmm. to get our hands around this for a couple of years. This was not a casual, easily arrived at benefit. And yes, we initiated it and we worked with Blue Cross. And we've been trying, we've been trying to deal with this issue. So I think one of the reasons it, it started this way is this is where we saw the most egregious claims and so we were starting to address um, what we, we saw the most of which was elective surgeries with non-participating providers. Uh, balance billing is, is a concern I mean, but I, nobody's just, yeah, addressing it. I understand. It. I'm just pointing uh -huh. out it seems a little bit contradictory because you could say that the person who's in the most gotcha position is the person who, through an accidental injury in an emergency, went to a non-participating <coughs> provider and then ends up with, it, with this huge uh, balance billing issue looking at them, which if that's the basis for your concern and wanting to push this change, you, it, it's, it's a little odd that you exempt yeah. them from it. That's all I'm... We right. get... We get at OPM about 2,000 what we call disputed claims a year. And that's where we start to see where our enrollees are having difficulty. Mm -hmm. And we were not getting those disputed claims on the emergency side. Okay. And you heard the doctor uh, earlier say that on emergency conditions, he was saying that their balance billing is not as, as large because they recognize it's an emergency. So maybe. Mm -hmm. The doctors haven't been balanced billing in those situations. We were not experiencing, we were not getting the, the uh, concerns from our enrollees, and so that's not where we started with this. Okay. So let me ask this question. The, um, you know, again, this is not a change that's being forced by the economics. Right, which was it what was I not. Had mm -hmm. I was, just, and I apologize because I hadn't read ahead to some of the testimony, but was the assumption I was going on uh, when the first panel was uh, before us. Um, but if, it, if it's not forced by the economics, then there's much more flexibility to try to fix this problem, maybe rethink it as others mm -hmm. have, have been um, suggesting. One question I had, and this would, this would follow on the observation that that the federal employees are astute shoppers. Um, had you thought about making it an option? Because it's about protecting the, the, uh, the consumer here. That was your goal. When I say an option, in other words, that you'd say to people, um, if, if you go out and network, there's two options that could be available to you. One is the one you've had, which was the 25% plus the, the, the exposure to the balanced billing. Or um, you could pick this option, which would be a cap at 7,500 through the deductible where you won't have any exposure to the balanced billing. Beyond that, and you being astute shoppers and trying to judge uh, particularly if it's if it's applicable to elective surgery only, where pr presumably you could try to ascertain um, ahead of time what right. the cost might be and the charges might mm -hmm. be. Um, you can choose as a consumer. Now, uh, I understand you might end up in a situation which which you don't want to have, which is where you've got people with different results hollering at each other and mm -hmm. hollering at you because mm -hmm. they're wondering, well, how come the person over here made out better right. than I did and I didn't realize when I picked one that I was getting foreclosed from this better scenario over here but mm -hmm. I just wondered if that was considered at all. Uh, that wasn't considered 
uh, I don't think in the past we've ever had an option for allowing folks to choose their benefit at point of service and and that has some negatives in that people are obviously going to cho choose what is financially the best interest to them and then it's hard for us to predict the cost but we are trying to find the right solution to provide the broadest protection for our federal employees and we will definitely work with Blue Cross on examining a multitude well, yeah, of and the options. The only reason I offered that, and I'll <coughs> close my question, but the only reason I offered it is because you alluded to the cost, you can't predict the cost. Right. But this is not this particular change, as we've all agreed, has not been driven by by the cost concerns on the plan side. Um, it's being driven by a desire to protect the consumer in some instances from him or herself mm -hmm. is what I'm hearing. So if that's what's driving it, then you could offer the option to the astute shopper to decide, well, you know, I want to take the chance on the balanced billing thing because I think this is where I'm going to end up, or I want that, that comfort of knowing I'll be capped out at the 7,500 if I have to go for this, mm -hmm. this out of network. Uh, and it may, there may be other reasons why that's mm -hmm. not a good idea, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that um, it, it at least is, an, is, is something to look at, given what's driving the proposal yeah. um, here. So. The better, of course, you know, the better thing for the enrollee is to try to find a participating uh, provider. Okay. It, since, since participating providers were uh, introduced into the program, there has always been a financial incentive for people to use them, and that that affords them the most protection in these instances because that those uh, charges that are not covered then are part of the catastrophic too but again we're we're willing and ha and happy to uh, to explore as many options as possible because we did not like to see what was happening to our enrollees uh, thank you mr thank you very much mr sarbanes um, mr gamarino let me Try and make sure that I understand why the Blue Cross premium for the standard plan increased more significantly than other plans, mm -hmm. and why that increase took place. The um, the experience of this group um, over the last couple years I exceeded the premiums coming in. So we were drawing down the reserves and we, we, um, we got to a point where we had to um, not only increase, but for the long run health of the product that so many people rely on, we had to make uh, benefit changes um, and actually keep this product in line with um, a lot of the competitive products out there. Um, we don't stand on an island alone. So when other people have products that allow them to price a product lower than ours, um, and this is a very price sensitive market, um, that type of alignment can't go, can't go on too long. And that's um, part of the reason why you saw the types of changes that, you, that, that we put in place for 2009. Do you know how much reserve you have had to, to draw? Our, our reserves right now stand at, at um, about 4.7 months, about $8 billion. Um, uh, and for the comfort of our enrollee, enrolled population, and particularly for these troubled times we're in, I, it, it should be noted for the record that these, these reserves are held by Uncle Sam uh, and are dedicated only to this product uh, um, and can only be used for this. And they're held in U.S. Treasury, so it's a very safe uh, financial instrument. Ms. Kitchak. We are up against the wall, in a sense, in terms of there only being six additional days for employees and beneficiaries to know what they are facing. Are there any statutory reasons that we cannot extend the enrollment period? Well, there is a process to go through. I mean, it's not, and, and not, created by me, but we're required to do public notice to extend it. 
So there is a process, but there is no statutory bar from extending the open season. And do you know how long the public notice? Uh, no, is? I don't. I think I, d I don't know. Hmm. I can certainly get that information for you quickly. Yeah, it, it would appear to me that while there isn't much that can be done, um, that it could be very beneficial and very helpful if the enrollees had additional time to really look at the instruments that they were going to be buying into mm -hmm. and where they had as much information. And I would suspect that many people are just beginning to take notice. I'm, I'm saying prior to now, they probably had not given much thought to it, and they were more than likely ready to re-up. I'm just thinking of my own um, situation where my primary care physician is making some changes, and we've been together for 15 years, mm -hmm. and I've got a, you know, I've got some considering to do before I decide if I'm going to follow mm. with him or if I'm going to mm. maintain what I already had. I knew that he was leaving, so at least in my case, I've had some time to think about it. But uh, I'm not sure that you know hundreds of thousands of, of our enrollees have had that opportunity. I think if we could look at that, and I'm, I, I'm trying to determine what harm, if it's possible. The, ha it the harm is, there, and there is harm, the harm is trying to get the information of, out to the carrier, the new ca to the carriers as to who they're covering in 2009. And we want to make sure that if something happens on January 1, 2009, and the person needs to go to the hospital, they have that card that says, this is the coverage I have. And uh, by extending open season, that is what we jeopardize. Uh, you know, this Would is, not particularly for our annuitants, a lot of this, you know, they're not in the office, they have to get information in it, it's a risk to extend the open season. But would not the enrollees maintain the same coverage that they had until they exercised an option to change? No, the, the effective dates for coverage are in the contract. Coverage for any open season change uh, becomes effective on January 1 for retirees. And I believe, and we've talked about I believe it's the the Monday of the first pay period of the uh, of the new calendar year for employees. I think I, I would certainly, as chairman of the subcommittee, appreciate a hard look at any possibility that there might be to give employees and retirees as much of an opportunity to be as informed as they could possibly become, and I would certainly appreciate that. We'll get back to you uh, very quickly. Ms. Norton, you have a Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think, uh, although I'd like to question um, Mr. Gambino about other ideas too, I think this would seem to be the easiest idea. Of course, you're covered if you it's choose hardy. before, you're covered if you choose before January 5th, even if you don't, as you indicate, have your enrollment card, you are covered. You, you are covered. It's just, it's just very stressful for the enrollee if they go someplace mm -hmm. for service yeah. and they don't have that card and there's a question. You're definitely covered. I can understand. The, the, the problem, um, uh, Ms. Kichak and Mr. Uh, Gamarino, comes from what amounts to a huge reliance on um, on um, the carrier to not in, 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 in do these kinds of increases very suddenly. And so if you get so that you depend upon your car carrier, because your, car your carrier has a, a good reputation 
for not putting large charges on you quickly, uh, then you have a reliance problem and a reliance trust, I may say, Ms. Kechak, that could be broken, which is something I don't think we want to have happen. And we do want a, a solution that takes into account uh, all, all concerned, uh, the government is, uh, and, and the, um, as well as, of course, uh, the provider. Now, it's important uh, that it's come out that you uh, initiated uh, this idea, and, and, and I, I can understand your concern if, the, you know, there were uh, what amounts to, I, I understand it, a rather small number, but uh, some providers who found themselves with a bill very much larger than they expected, uh, you'd want to uh, somehow uh, uh, prepare them for this up front rather than have mm -hmm. this come uh, after the surgery. Uh, did you suggest a large amount might be in fact in order? Did, did you, who brought this idea I, I to Blue Cross Blue Shield, <coughs> suggest that in order to get the attention of the, of the subscriber, uh, a large amount um, per surgery might be in order. No, we did not suggest a large amount to get people's attention. This was strictly, um, when I answered the question, it wasn't cost driven. We did not make this change to increase costs or to save money. But what we did was we priced from a, an actuarial point of view how much it would cost to cover these charges uh, over X amount and how much would be saved by billing under X amount and 7,500 was where uh, the people at the low end were contributing enough money to fund the people in the catastrophic situation. Yeah, I see. I see that. So it's, we did it's not do it. important to understand how this, um, right. where this amount came from. Did and we, you, pro we did probably, you and we have you looked at this, if, 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 if you're not in business, but you're looking at this simply uh, by doing the math, uh, you may not consider that there might be other ways to do it. Did you consider, Ms. Kichak, uh, in your discussions with Gamarino, that there might be alternatives uh, to simply pricing the amount in light of the figures that were before you? Absolutely. This was, this was I do not know all the back and forth, but this was not a simple, how about this and let's do it. This was a negotiation in which uh, we ask we ask for proposals to resolve this question. They responded. Uh, we went back and forth. But you we, look like you knew exactly what the amount was because you said it was about seventy five hundred dollars well, per. Well, that was when we came to the let's do the cost neutral within this. Well, benefit. you know, that, you know, that, again, there's a difference between somebody who hasn't, doesn't have to worry about customers and providers and somebody who can sit in the government and say this is what the figures are. I mean, Mr. McGamarino got the point, Ms. Kechak. <laughs> You showed him some figures, uh, and it sounds to me as though those figures were highly suggestive uh, and did not, in fact, encourage um, Mr. Gamarino to think of other ways that might have accomplished, and I have no idea, but might have accomplished uh, uh, something of the same uh, uh, purpose. Uh, and and I, th I really do think it's going to be very important, uh, particularly for, oh, uh, for, uh, for um, OPM, is this, if this is what you're in the business of doing, mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that I have uh, learned f uh, from my work uh, in chairing another subcommittee is what I don't know about business. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my approach would certainly not, not have been to say, here's the cost, <laughs> you come up with what you're going to do about it. It would have been to say, here's the cost, now, uh, uh, now how can we make sure that cost is not this, this was worked at, this, this was a bilateral negotiation back and forth. All this negotiations are by definition bilateral. I think you get my point, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I want to go on. Uh, I, I think the fact that a concrete figure uh, from the government is before the provider sends a very strong message, and I am suggesting uh, that you play a dual role here that mm -hmm. more and more I find uh, in conflict with uh, uh, one another, um, because you are, um, you are. I'm not sure you are, in fact, who you are representing uh, here. 
uh, when all the alternatives, which in a real sense isn't your job. You don't know how to consider all the alternatives. That's what Mr. Gamrino is in business for. And if he were made uh, to show why some alternatives he might suggest would or would not accomplish the same uh, end, then I, I would be convinced. But I, and that's what I call a bilateral, uh, 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 a bilateral negotiation, where I'm in the position of the government. I'm not in business. And I know that anybody who is in business does not want to raise anything. He doesn't want to raise a cent. So if it looks like the government's given him permission to do it, uh, then, of course, it makes it far easier than it would be if the government said, look, uh, I know you don't want for, to, to, to put a, a, what people will see as an additional cost. This, however, is what it costs your network. Therefore, uh, show me how you might accomplish uh, the cost saving for all involved, because I'm with you on that, mm -hmm. uh, through either uh, uh, imposing uh, a, 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 uh, a cost up front so people know in advance or through an alternative you may name. That, in my judgment, uh, where one side knows a whole lot more than the other, you know a whole lot more about what it's costing across the network. Mm -hmm. He knows a whole lot more uh, about um, uh, alternatives that might be useful. Uh, Mr. Gamarino, um, I don't know, uh, I, I'm not convinced that Extending the, day, uh, extending the time would be catastrophic. I think it would mean a, that something's not in your hands. Uh, I think it would, would, would if I were, were OPM, I wouldn't like to be the government here saying, I, the government, who did not, in fact, uh, who in fact uh, allowed this summary to go forward, which said that there will be some additional costs. I, the government, say, because I've saved you money, be happy. Uh, and to ignore the transparency matter, which what the government is there for. So I don't, I don't understand her role. But I do understand your role. And I do understand the difficulty this raises for you. It, it seems to me that there are a number of things you could do. You could go back to the status quo ante right now. Uh, you could, uh, and I'm only interested in remedies here. You could say, okay, we're going to try to make up for at least some of this next year, but there wasn't kind of fair notice that subscribers are used to from Blue Cross. So, you know, okay. I don't, I, I don't think it makes you less competitive. You could do it after it closed uh, and not throw everything up uh, for people trying to shift one way or the other. You could um, uh, distinguish among kinds of surgery very, uh, very sharply keeping in mind what we in the law call as the reasonable man theory. What does the average person mean by surgery? And you could, if there are costs, and you go back to the status quo ante, you could, in 2010, try to make up for those costs uh, in a more transparent way. Do you, th do you, do you find any of those unreasonable uh, suggestions? I think they're all something that we should um evaluate. I mean, I, I think I've been pretty clear that I don't want to stick with the status quo. Um, and um, I think I've been clear about the reasons for that. And they're, they're focused um, on the member. This is not um, how I want our members uh, to see our product um, uh, going forward. And um, uh, it's not what I want the brand to stand for. And, uh, it, 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 and, and of course, um, uh, we didn't. We, we don't see that it's going to save you a lot of money. This just is not. This is not a money issue. Uh, so for I'm, me, I'm, I'm just looking for some sense mm. that anybody in business is looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a lot of goodwill uh, out here now. You know, Miss Keychak doesn't care about your goodwill. She's doing her job. <laughs> she does it very well, but in my mm -hmm. judgment, quite too bureaucratically. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to care about that. And th therefore, I'm, I'm looking for some way to send a message to the consumer that the reliance you've had on Blue Cross Blue Shield I I is still uh, intact. In um, uh, I do want to ask you something about your surplus. You mentioned reserves. My question did not go to reserves. Okay. It went to surplus uh, and your nonprofit status. Uh, 
I, I don't touch the notion of reserves, mm -hmm. uh, especially for healthcare insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I don't touch much the notion of surplus. Um, but of course, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is unique in the business uh, as a nonprofit. Um, and there have been some uh, concerns. Let me ask you, would you prefer uh, to be a, a nonprofit? Uh, you had the company uh, had some issues with that before, or not, and why not, or why? Well, there, the, 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 the um, plans that are independent companies um, that are licensed for the brand, the, the, we, there are 39 independent companies. Um, they've, ch they've chosen to collectively underwrite the cost, um, the, uh, the under, underwrite the FEHBP product we have. But outside of that, they are independent uh, companies. Um, most of them are not for profit. There is one for profit. So the brand itself doesn't dictate one or the other. Now, by the way, which is the <coughs> for profit one? It's WellPoint. WellPoint is the parent company. Uh, when you see uh, it align with Blue Cross Blue Shield, you normally see it align with um, Blue Cross Blue Shield Anthem of Ohio, or Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Isn't it true that, mm. that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield sought to be, a, sought to get rid of its nonprofit status um, in recent years? Which, is, is there a particular plan when you say Blue Cross Blue Shield? Care First, for example. I think Care First uh, a couple years ago um, went down that path, but I think um, they clearly didn't. Why do you think? Why, why, why do you think? Why was that? Why is that better for some plans? I think it. I think. Um, uh, and and I'm not a proponent on either business model because um, they both work um, under the brand. Um, the brand licensure requires uh, fiscal accountability. So why would some prefer servicing. one? And, not, and I uh, think you know it. it um, in my from from what I see, a lot depends upon your market. A lot depends upon your need for capital. A lot depends upon the, the competitive models out up in your particular market that are successful. And, and um, uh, certainly, depending upon uh, your, sometimes your relative financial health, um, uh, capital may be easier if you are a for-profit to obtain. Um, and uh, and there's uh, been so some testimony um, before from the prior witness mm -hmm. and and from you about the use of uh, uh, you indicated reserves. I I need to know whether the surplus, the very large surplus that, and I, by the way I'm I, I, I'm agnostic mm -hmm. on on a surplus, mm -hmm. uh, particularly since there are no standards for mm -hmm. for how much surplus mm -hmm. or not surplus. A uh, company like yours should have, but you know, as it continued to grow and to get very large, uh, then uh, people began to look at Blue Cross Blue Shield because it is nonprofit, and if you had a large surplus, mm -hmm. you're supposed to distribute some of it. And then people got be hungry about your surplus, and they had their hands mm -hmm. out for your surplus. And the standard answer, uh, as I've indicated, is well, we use it to uh, keep down uh, the cost for our subscribers. That's right. perfectly satisfactory. Mm -hmm. In fact, that's the best mm -hmm. use of it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, are you, uh, 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 is in fact, cause, cause your answer, I mean, when you referred to my question before, you mentioned reserves. I'm, I'm asking you, is, uh, is the surplus being used, instead of being distributed the way nonprofits do it, um, is a surplus being used, uh, let us uh, say in this region, for example, to keep down the cost of, of health care here relative to what uh, other companies face. Yeah, uh, I think you're talking outside of the FEHBP. Is that correct? Yeah, the I'm, 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 you're talking I'm, about outside of. of yes, that. I'm, yeah, I'm and speaking and about the surplus. Yeah, and, and, and I'm not prepared um, really to address that. I, you know, every Blue Cross Blue Shield plan is regulated by the the state that they're that they're licensed in, and and, and those definitions, as you just point out, uh, Ms. Norton, they, they probably vary. Uh, in terms of what's considered a surplus. I think also the um, economic times probably uh, may, may um, cause people to rethink well, what a surplus is. I, I know today, uh, collectively, Blue Cross Blue Shield is very proud of the fact that our 100 plus members nationwide 
can feel very secure in the fact that financially, collectively, and independently, um, uh, we have sufficient capital to um, ride out with our members um, this economic downturn. Yeah, I, it's hard to be an enemy of, of surpluses even before the yeah. president turned down. Uh, what, of course, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has to be aware of is as, it as a nonprofit, it gets uh, more scrutiny uh, from the government because of it in just this, pa this year. Sure, uh, sure There it was does. a big controversy involving Care First here mm -hmm. when uh, a lar large, um, uh, a, a large um, uh, payment to uh, an executive who was leaving was paid, and, and the Maryland Insurance Commissioner required that it be uh, cut in, in half, citing the inconsistency of such a large payout of severance, uh, the inconsistency with the nonprofit mission. Uh, so I just, I just remind, remind you of this, not to, uh, not to beat up on the surplus. I'm where you are. How much? I'm not even sure what the surplus, anybody's surplus, is today. Uh, but, uh, but to say that one of the reasons we are we are looking at Blue Cross Blue Shields is is that so many federal employees. Uh, but the other reason is that you are very different uh, because of the nonprofit uh, status you enjoy uh, or not, considering whether or not you'd, like, you'd rather be a commercial company. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and uh, it appears to me that maybe you're being warned <laughs> that there are individuals who are seeking ways to tax everything that may not including religious institutions, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> including hospitals, <laughs> including probably Blue Cross <laughs> Blue Shield. Hopefully we won't mm -hmm. get to the point where, you know, Russia got one time when they didn't have anything to tax, and they ended up wanting to put a tax on the air. Well, we wouldn't want to mm -hmm. get to that point, I'm sure. Thank you both very much. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, Mr. I, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I wonder if I could just clarify um, uh, one thing that I heard. There, there was a question of, of, of Mr. Francis um, related to Medicare B and, um, and the issue with the uh, uh, non-participating physician is 7,500. And uh, where does that fit if they have Medicare B? Are they still required to pay that? And, and I, I did want to uh, indicate that um, uh, when our members have Medicare B as primary and we're secondary, uh, any type of cost sharing, whether it be deductibles, co-insurance, or co-payments, um, would be waived. So it specifically in the case of that 7,500, um, it, it will be waived. So I wanted to make sure the committee understood that. Thank you very much, and thank you both, and thank all of those who've attended. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.